advisory committee meeting to order. Um, and uh, thanks to everyone for being here. And uh, like, I want to make a particular um, shout out to staff. I know you've all been dealing with a lot of transition and have been working your butts off. And we have a really impressive slate of properties that we'll be considering today. So uh, thank you all for everything that you do. And thank you all for um, helping me work through all of this as well too, and the rest of the committee. Um, we I'm get too far, are we live? Cool. All right, um, I'm gonna go through some of our logistics, um, our, our structural logistics uh, before we do all of our introductions and vote on, on the minutes and all of that. Um, I am obviously Alicia McGill, as it says on my um, slide here, and I'm, I'm chair of the advisory committee. Uh, I would like to um, welcome Reed Wilson, our um, secretary of the North Carolina Department of Cultural, Natural and Cultural Resources today. And also this is my first meeting with Dr. Waters as well, our um, deputy secretary of the Office of Archives and History. So um, welcome to both of you and it's great to meet you. And I know we have a couple of new committee members too. So I'm thrilled to uh, connect with all of you. I, I know my understanding is that um, Secretary Wilson will give us um, uh, some, some comments after we've done introductions um, and before our reports. Is that, is that correct? Am I? Okay. All right. Great. Um, the meeting is being live streamed, as, as um, Matt um, pointed out for all of us, um, to the public via YouTube. Uh, and the meeting is being recorded, including the video. So I just um, like to tell everybody that. And the public is unable to comment um, audio and live, but um, we do have the ability, my understanding is that we have the ability for people to comment through the YouTube um, stream and that those comments can then be shared with us. Um, if we have any kind of significant tech issues, I will um, assess if we need to take a break and um, uh, leave the meeting and come back and I will update everyone through both the chat room and um, email about that. Um, and uh, what else? Or if we need to take an early uh, lunch or something like that, please mute yourselves during your present um, during the presentations um, and discussion unless you're speaking and uh, you can use the chat room to share resources or pose questions if you're having any issues with your audio but please avoid any kind of side conversations and please avoid discussion of the properties and the presentations in the um, chat room uh, as well un unless you're having like an, an audio issue um, I want to remind everybody about the conflict of interest policy. Um, I would like if anyone has a conflict of interest for any of the presentations, um, either our, our first slate of National Register property presentations or for the, the study list, that you disclose those now um, so that we make sure that we have quorum if people have to leave. Are there any conflicts of interest? No, great. Um, how voting will work. Um, we will do a, a roll call vote as we have been doing through our uh, remote meeting. So it, it will take a little bit longer, but this is um, necessary because of the remote structure of our, our meeting. Um, we will vote per set of presentations rather than uh, per property, unless there are properties that we anticipate having a significant amount of discussion about um, or if for some reason anyone has to step out, any of our committee members have to step out. Um, we do, as you're aware, have a full slate of National Register nominations. Uh, we will likely take um, a lunch break around between 12 and 1230, um, but we'll kind of assess that based on how um, the presentations are going and how we're moving along. Ideally, do not hang up when you leave the meeting, um, unless you have to, um, and mute your mic and turn off your video through Zoom um, and just leave the Zoom program open. Um, I will have us take a couple of um, short breaks in the morning and in the one in the morning and one in the afternoon, one before lunch and one after lunch. Uh, probably we'll take the morning one around 11.15. And if um, 
staff, someone from staff could remind me uh, to do so because sometimes I lose track. Um, I think that's all of the logistics. Um, so we'll, we'll go into um, the consideration of the minutes. Are there any questions or corrections to the minutes from the June meeting? Nope. Uh, okay. This might, you know, I see a, uh, just a few minor uh, 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 on page uh, one, uh, the third paragraph from the bottom. Uh, Dr. Denard asked Ms. Barchus, ass, too many ass there. So uh, take out an ass there if she kept abreast of the work of other HPOs. Okay, that's on uh, uh, the first page. And then on the third page, the uh, uh, beginning of the second paragraph, taking the floor from Ms. Beckman Black. And I think the proper meaning there would be taking the floor after. It's a little, uh, uh, a little note there. It would, it would appear to read better if we say taking the floor after as opposed to taking the floor from, okay? So that's the, uh, uh, those are the two uh, uh, little things I saw, but overall, these are uh, these are excellent minutes, uh, very well uh, prepared. Okay, thank you, Dr. Denard. Is there a motion to um, approve the minutes with those um, changes made? So moved, Matt Jorgensen. All right, um, and we do have to I vote. Would... Second, thank you. Dr. Denard, um, for this vote, can someone remind me, do we have to do a roll call vote or can we just do a show of hands? Okay, we do need to do a roll call vote. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go through our list. Um, Dr. Johnson. Yes. Thank you. And again, we're voting to approve the minutes. Um, Ms. Josie Ward. Yes. And it's Josie, correct? That's right. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Mr. Sean Patch. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brian, is Dr. Brian here? Okay, I didn't see her, but um, Mr. Matt Jorgensen. Oh, you, yes. sorry, I you were, I'm yeah, here. thanks. <laughs> um, Mr. David Bergstone. You're muted. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Fred Belladin. Yes. Dr. Brothers. Yes. I vote yes, Alicia McGill and uh, Mr. David Ruffin. Yes. Thank you very much. All right, our minutes are approved. Um, so now we will jump into uh, introductions and uh, we will have the committee members introduce themselves first and then we'll have um, staff and any other um, presenters or consultants who are here uh, introduce themselves as well. Um, and I'm just gonna kind of go through my screen and, and ask people to, to do so. Uh, I am uh, Alicia McGill. I'm faculty in the Department of History at NC State where I contribute to our public history programs. We have a master's and PhD program in public history. I also have a background in anthropology and archeology. span um, So I, and I've been on the committee for um, all of my terms. So my last meeting I think is this summer. Um, which I'm sad about, but uh, okay. That's me, um, Josie. Hello all, I'm Josie Ward. I'm an architectural historian who works as an independent consultant in Asheville. And this is my second meeting and the first that I was able to fully prepared for. So I'm happy to be a part. Great, thank you. Welcome, Dr. Brothers. Good morning, everyone. Dr. Tamara Holmes Brothers. Deputy Director of the North Carolina Arts Council, as well as Vice Chair of the North Carolina African American Heritage Commission. Thank you. Um, Sean Patch. Good morning, all. My name is Sean Patch. I'm an archaeologist with New South Associates in Greensboro. Now, this is, I'm new to the committee. This is my second meeting, and I'm, I'm pleased to be here. So, thank you all. Yeah, welcome. Thanks. 
Mr. Jorgensen. Uh, good morning, my name is Matt Jorgensen. Um, pronouns are he, him. I'm an archeologist and I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. Thank you. Uh, Fred, Mr. Belladin is next on my screen here. Good morning, my name is Fred Belladin. I'm an architect with Clearscapes here in Raleigh and um, we do a lot of adaptive use and preservation work. So thrilled to be here and to meet the new folks. Thank you. Thanks. Dr. Gennard. Okay, I am a former member of the history department at East Carolina University and former director of the African African American Studies Program at that institution. I am uh, uh, in a state of uh, nice retirement at this point. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ruffin. Uh, yes, David Ruffin. I am chair of the North Carolina Historical Commission and uh, I've been a member since uh, 2017. Glad right. to be with you today. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bergstone. Yeah, I'm David Bergstone. I'm a historic preservationist. I'm currently director of facilities for Sam Congregation, which is a place back in the 18th century. And um, previously, it was about 25 years, was director of architecture at Old Salem Museums and Gardens. Great. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Johnson. Good morning, all. Um, Valerie Ann Johnson. I'm Dean of Arts, Sciences, and Humanities at Shaw University in Raleigh. I am also serve as the chair of the African American Heritage Commission, and I'm on the Historical Commission. So I've got a, a, few, a few things, and this is my second rotation on the um, NRAC. Thank you. And I'm an anthropologist, too. Okay. <laughs> yeah, stick to That's right. Thank you. Uh, all right. Now, uh, I think, um, Julie, you're first on my screen here. Morning, everyone. I'm Julie Smith, the National Register Assistant for the Historic Preservation Office in Raleigh. Thank you, Julie. Uh, Hannah. Um, my name is Hannah Beckman Black, and I am the new preservation specialist for the Historic Preservation Office based in Asheville. Thanks. But I've been around for a couple of years now. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ramona. Good morning, everyone. Ramona Bartis, I'm the Deputy State Historic Preservation Officer. Thrilled to see you all this morning. Great. Thank you, Ramona. Dr. Waters. Good morning. Thank you. I am Darren Waters, uh, the new Deputy Secretary for Archives and History. Come to the department by way of Asheville. I'm a native of Asheville and by way of the University of North Carolina at Asheville. So I'm glad to be here. This is my second meeting. Great. Thank you. Okay. Claudia, welcome back. <laughs> You're muted. Sorry. Good morning. I'm Claudia Brown. I'm the former supervisor of the Survey and National Register branch. And I retired a little over three years ago, came back part time, been mostly reviewing National Register nominations. And this is the first time I'm making presentations since I retired. So it's nice to be here. Thanks. Sarah. Good morning, all. I'm Sarah Woodard. I uh, still refer to myself as the new Claudia. Uh, I'm the branch <laughs> supervisor for the Survey and National Register branch. And glad to see everyone. Great. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Wilson, I'm going to have you introduce yourself. I know that you will give us some more formal comments after we finish all these introductions. But I'm Reed Wilson, and I work for Darren and Ramona. Thank you. Um, John, what? Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. I'm John Wood. I'm a restoration specialist and the supervisor of the SHPO's Eastern Regional Field Office in Greenville. Thank you. Beth. Good morning. I'm Beth King. I'm the architectural survey coordinator for the State Historic Preservation Office. Thank you. Jeff Smith. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jeff Smith. Uh, I am a architectural survey specialist here with uh, based in Raleigh with the North Carolina State Historic Preservation Office. 
and I've been here just over two years. Thank you. Um, and we also have Matt Zare here, our IT support. Matt, do you have any comments for us or? Okay, <laughs> thank you. Matt solves all of our problems for us and also ensures that if we have um, public comments in the YouTube stream, um, he shares those with us as well. Great. Um, so now uh, we will move on to some comments from Secretary Wilson. Sure. Happy to do so. Welcome. Uh, good to, thank you. Good to see all of you. Uh, you know, as we always say these days, looking forward to the day when we can do this in person. And if it involves Neo Mond, as some of you were discussing earlier, I'm all in. Make sure to invite me. Uh, but it is good to see you. I appreciate this opportunity to uh, talk with all of you. Um, and I appreciate the role you play as the review board for decisions concerning, you know, does a property actually meet the criteria to be listed on the National Registry? This is a really important uh, question that you all help us solve every time you get together and all the work you do in between the meetings to, to come to those decisions. So I really appreciate that. I also uh, salute your endurance because I understand your meetings sometimes go quite a long time because you have so many properties uh, and, and proposals to go through. Uh, and I also just wanna welcome the two new members to the advisory committee. You are joining a great group of folks who do a wonderful job. Um, this is a big year at uh, the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources for a couple of reasons, a lot of reasons. But first, uh, we are 50 years old, which is kind of hard to believe. Um, and we will be celebrating that online uh, in every single day, but also we will be having in-person events around the state, DNCR days, we will call them. Um, so we can um, share the things that this department does with communities across the state. You know, everything, you know, we have the things people love literally from A to Z, Arts Council, Zoo, and so many other things in between that you all are aware of, historic sites, historic preservation, history museums, science museum, symphony, um, archeology, span uh, aquariums, parks, art museum, two art museums, it goes on and on, archives, I mean, we, are involved and interact with people in North Carolina in so many different ways. And this 50th anniversary gives us a chance to deepen those connections with people in North Carolina across the state. Um, second big reason why this is an important year for our department is uh, we had a really successful uh, budget for our department approved by the legislature and signed by Governor Cooper. Um, which will, I believe, prove to be transformative across our department. Everything from the zoo, where uh, they received $75 million to get them closer to their goal so they can construct two new um, continents, Asia and Australia. Um, and it'll take them longer than six days, but you know they got a plan and they're going to get it done. Uh, to the you know, four of our history museums got funding for capital projects, uh, which is really important. Um, the symphony got funding historic sites, which by their very nature, as you all know, are old and need maintenance and repair and upkeep. Historic Sites Division got a million dollars for maintenance, a uh, million dollars additional. And that's gonna be a huge help for those sites across the state. Um, art museum, parks and trails, all of these parts of our department got significant increases in their funding. And importantly, it's not just that there's more funding for our operations and for our capital projects, but we also have significant grant programs um, that help local communities that, that were pumped up significantly too. We make grants to local parks and recreation departments, to local arts councils and arts organizations, um, to science museums and nature centers around the state and to local libraries. So all of those community institutions that are valued um, by their communities are gonna be doing even better and coming out of this pandemic stronger than before. Um, 
the one thing where you want to contemplate for the future is, hmm, why doesn't this department have funded by the legislature history grants for local history assets around the state? So that's something we're going to explore um, because, you know, this is a state with a lot of rich history. Um, important to note, uh, several things relevant to Ramona's division, increased funding in the Highway Historical Market Program from 60,000 to 100,000 per year, and it's required, it's not just an option anymore from DOT. Um, Reenactment of the more generous mill rehabilitation tax credit, expansion and extension of the historic rehabilitation tax credit. I mean, we hope that these improved enhanced incentives are just gonna to continue to expand historic preservation across the state. African-American Heritage Commission got more funding and a new position. The archives, Eastern office got a new disaster recovery specialist. And um, the new budget created a new American Indian Heritage Commission, uh, which will belong to this department. And we are working hard to set that up and that will have uh, two staff people to begin with. And the job postings are already out, um, which is pretty quick. Um, in state government to have those going up so soon after the budget was approved, but they're a high priority. And then there's a lot of other directed grants in the budget to local history museum, historic sites that don't belong to the state, but legislators put them in to help those assets in their communities. Um, so I think what this all means is, is um, well, people love our department, the things we do, but there's a lot of funding in here for history and historic preservation and incentives for historic preservation. And I think it's a, res a recognition by the legislative leaders and the rank and file in the legislature and the governor of how important uh, historic preservation and telling history is in North Carolina. Um, you know, you, I know you all had a, a busy 2021. I'm just looking at the numbers. 35 new nominations to the National Register, more than 20 new study lists, properties, 14 new or updated architectural history surveys. Um, and I know you have a busy agenda today, and I expect that you all will continue to have busy agendas uh, in your future meetings just because so many people recognize the benefits of historic preservation, whether it's preserving community character, stimulating local economic development and revitalization, um, giving people incentives so that they can do really cool things to preserve the historic character of their properties. I mean, I think people understand the value of what you all are working on. And that's important that the legislature and the governor do understand that. And it's because local communities understand how important historic preservation is. And I would also note that um, roughly a quarter of the new National Register nominations um, in 2021 were associated with African American history. Um, and that's important because one of the things that Dr. Waters and Ramona and others on our history side of our department are very focused on is a priority to ensure that we are telling a broad and inclusive and diverse history in North Carolina. I mean, we have a um, complex and diverse history in this state. And we need to make sure that we are telling stories that um, will enlighten people about our past and instruct us how we got to where we are today, and maybe even shine a light on how we get to a better future. And the role that historic preservation plays in that effort to um, uh, share this diverse and inclusive history with the people in North Carolina is so important. So I appreciate that that is um, a focus you all have in your work. And, you know, the other big thing that's coming up, but it's not this year, but we're building towards it is America 250. And that is something that um, our archives and his, Ar archives and records division director, Sarah Kuntz is spearheading, uh, not only for our department, but the whole state to ensure that as we try to answer the question, when are we us, uh, that we are including rich stories and, compli and complex history, diverse, inclusive, so that as we celebrate 250 in the years leading up to it and probably thereafter, 
we provide really important history uh, lessons, education to people of all ages in the state so that they do understand really the breadth and depth of, of history in this state and not just the history they may have learned years ago. We need to do much better at expanding horizons in people's minds about how we got to where we are. Um, I've had so many really enlightening conversations with Darren and Ramona and others on our history side of the shop. I am not a historian, but I'm starting to think, wow, you know, we have this opportunity both in this 50th year of our department and leading up to the 250th birthday of our country's founding to really help people understand how we got to where we are. And the role you all play in preserving history uh, in so many ways is critical to that. So I thank you for all your efforts that you've done in the past and will do today and will continue today in the months and meetings and years ahead. Again, great uh, to see all of you. I appreciate this opportunity to say hello. And um, I will turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Secretary Wilson. Um, and yeah, we're happy to have you here. So it's great to hear all the exciting things going on. Um, Dr. Waters and Ramona, do you both have reports that you will give to us as well? Excellent. Um, so I will start, we'll start with Dr. Waters. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, thank, I want to thank uh, Secretary Wilson for being here as well. He's been joining many of the commission board meetings uh, throughout the department, and he's made my job easy, which is really good since I'm still very new. I think I just two days ago, I hit my fifth month in this role, um, and he's made my life really easy, not only in helping me transition into the role, but by coming to these meetings as well, because I was going down my list of things and, and he has checked off each one of those things that we could have addressed. And he also is saying that he's not a historian, but he's quickly becoming a very good one. So we were, we're having great uh, conversations together. I think he told me when I joined the, the department uh, five months ago, he said, you were gonna have so much fun. And that is accurate because I'm having a really good time just getting the opportunity to work with this wonderful staff in this department. This is a highly competent, very efficient group. Even though they're down in their numbers, they're still taking on uh, an, an enormous amount of work. I am deeply impressed by that every day. I think Ramona will echo those words as well. Ramona will tell you as well that each meeting that we have, we have our weekly one-on-one -on -one meetings. And if I go out into the field meeting people, as I did yesterday, I was in Milton yesterday to, uh, to tour the Thomas uh, Day home, and it's going to be coming online as a state historic site. I come back with multiple questions in our one-on-one -on -one meetings quickly go off the rails into places that I really want to, you know, I have all of these questions. So I appreciate her uh, being so flexible to allow me to ask those questions. But it's a reminder, again, of just how wonderful the staff here is. And I really come back every day, not only having fun, but really believing that I do have the best job in state government. This is, uh, this is really, <laughs> Reed is disagreeing. I think he may say he has the best job. But I want to take the time just to thank you all for the work that you do. I'm looking forward to how this meeting today is going to unfold. It will be an even more learning experience for me as, as you all work through these nominations and the study list. Uh, Ramona and I are talking this morning, we're saying it must be something out in the ether because we'll, we'll talk about something, I'll raise something. And then I get a phone call from someone, uh, Josie, out in Asheville of all places saying, we'd like for you to consider this. So it's interesting how that actually works. But uh, Madam Chair, thank you for giving me the opportunity just to address you. Thank you again to the secretary for the report that he gave. One thing that I will point out that when he, he said that, uh, uh, he addressed the issue about the money that state historic sites got for R&R and repairs, that million dollars, this will be recurring money. So that is a great opportunity for what we can do in that area. 
Um, I was in a meeting earlier this week as we talked through that, and I feel like I'm in, a, in the movie Brewster's Millions right, right now because we're trying to figure out how to spend this money and spend it quickly. So we look forward to continuing to do that, continuing to, be, to build community support for the work that we're doing here. And that's going to mean Ramona's team is going to need more people working. And so we're hoping to be able to advocate for that, uh, backing up the secretary as he makes a case for that. So thank you again. I am glad to be here. I look forward to this meeting today. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're thrilled to have you on board. <laughs> Ramona. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and may I thank Secretary Wilson and, and Dr. Waters, who's also our State Historic Preservation Officer, I might add, uh, for their kind words and, and the report to show you there's a lot of legislative interest, a lot of legislative uh, support for what we're trying to accomplish. Because I I think you'll all recognize we are in the long game for stewardship and recognition of all of North Carolina's historic places and the people that they represent. Um, so I just wanted to take a, a moment to, again, praise our staff and also connect the dots a little bit on who's doing what these days, because um, all of you are so critical to our National Register program, and you know best probably Sarah Woodard's group, uh, the Survey and National Register branch. So I wanted to, to give you a little bit of uh, background on who's doing what now. Um, as you know, Scott Power retired last summer, and you heard John Wood uh, identify himself as our new Eastern Office Supervisor. So uh, because that was an internal promotion, that then opens up John's old position. So we're going to be in the process of filling that. And that will be uh, re-strategized uh, uh, as just a survey and national register position. John was uh, splitting his duties on both sides in a smaller uh, number of counties. So that's coming along uh, through HR. Um, Annie McDonald, those of you who uh, recall Annie McDonald, uh, from the Western office. We also had an internal transfer. Hannah Beckman Black is now serving in that. So she gets to enjoy the scene that you see behind me uh, more frequently. And we're thrilled to have her also in that position. But with her going to Asheville, that creates a vacancy in what had been her Southeastern North Carolina uh, position. So you see, we're, we're playing a little bit of musical chairs here, but we're hoping to get that out on the street uh, to, to fill shortly as well. <clears throat> and then the other absent person that you might recognize uh, is Jen Bros, who was our very capable, very conscientious National Register coordinator. Uh, her husband took a job out of state, and so she went with uh, her spouse to Nebraska. And so we miss Jen very much, but that position is actually out on NC Jobs right now. So if you know of anyone who is interested in that, we would be very thrilled to have them submit an application. Um, so with that sort of connecting the dots, I just wanna emphasize Sarah's group is at 50% capacity. Um, we normally have a symphony, we now have more of a quartet, but having said that, I really want to thank Claudia Brown uh, for coming along to, to help us with uh, the vacancies we have. We've also um, backfilled internally to make sure that we have all of our territorial um, responsibilities. Uh, so we have some constituents being able to talk to someone when they contact us. So I wanna also acknowledge Jeff Smith and Julie Smith um, have stepped up and taken some counties on. I think Jeff is sort of filling in where Hannah used to um, be what county she was responsible for. I've even stepped up and taken a few counties in, in uh, the Greensboro area. So um, I get to put my, my rusty architectural historian hat on as well. And Sarah also has uh, divvied up some more counties and taken on some more responsibility. So uh, when, when we all recognize what a hardworking staff we have, we really have a hardworking staff. And they are not only very conscientious and expert, they're also very passionate and very much people oriented in what they're doing. So I just want to have a big thank you uh, and my hats off to everyone to have made all of this come, come forward because we we do have a long agenda today with lots of properties that constituents are interested in seeing move forward in the process. So uh, Dr. McGill, thank you for the time to acknowledge all of their hard work. Thank you, Ramona. Really appreciate all of that information about all of the movement and action that's going on. Um, we will now move into our uh, slate of um, presentations for the National Register. And uh, 
Hannah is first on the list here. So um, is this your first presentation for the West? Uh, it is. I, yeah. I don't think I did any last time. I can't remember that far back, to be honest. But um, yeah, we do have one property uh, from the West today. So I'll go ahead and share my screen if that's okay. Um, let's see here. Okay, you all see that? Great, okay. Um, so as I mentioned, our only National Register property from the Western region today is Skyline Lodge, and it was added to the state study list in October of 2019. So some of you might recall it. Um, Skyline Lodge is located in Southeast Macon County, roughly three miles northwest of the resort community of Highlands. The lodge is locally significant under Criterion A in the area of entertainment and recreation as a mid-century resort hotel built to capitalize on the tourist industry in Highlands and Macon County. It's also locally significant under Criterion C in the area of architecture as a hotel building that demonstrates Wrightian influence on modernist architecture. Because of the property's complicated development history, there are two periods of significance. The first is 1936 through 38, encompassing the time when the hotel project was first conceived, partially constructed, and then abandoned. And the second is 1965 through 72, encompassing the project's completion and successful operation as a mountaintop resort. The lodge was commissioned in 1936 by Howard Randall, a wealthy Ohio businessman, to accommodate visitors to the town of Highlands. Highlands was founded in 1875, and by the 1930s, it was a booming vacation destination with several established hotels in town, the Highlands Country Club with a Donald Ross-designed golf course, and a wealth of other outdoor activities. Randall hired Cincinnati-based architect Arthur Kelsey to design the hotel, and construction began in 1937. These are some of Kelsey's drawings from the uh, original uh, planned hotel. Original plans included a lodge and restaurant wing, two-story bedroom wing, two-story garage with servants' quarters above, all flanking a central courtyard leading to the lodge. Here are some of Kelsey's elevation drawings. While it remains unclear whether Kelsey trained under Frank Lloyd Wright, research indicates that the, the Kelsey family knew Wright personally and numerous features of Kelsey's work display Wright's influence. As stated in the nomination, the character defining features of this complex are its association with the natural setting of the mountains which was a key principle of the Wrightian style. The lodge design incorporated local rough cut granite, wood siding and finishes, large outdoor terraces and bands of windows providing guests with spectacular views of the surrounding mountains. Other Wrightian features include the emphasis on horizontality with low pitched roofs, cantilevered eaves and other cantilevered decorative details. So I'll show you some photos of the property during its construction in 1930, in the 1930s, juxtaposed with Kelsey's elevation drawings. So this is the lodge entrance as it originally appeared. Here's the rear of the lodge showing that restaurant wing. And this is the back of the garage and kitchen manager's apartment wing. Um, it's difficult to see here, but uh, these are some cantilevered stone steps leading to the manager's apartment, and those are still around today. Unfortunately, construction was halted following Randall's death in 1938. At the time, the exterior of the hotel was 90% complete with the interior. Um, the interior was nothing but rough framing with no electrical or plumbing work. The hotel sat vacant until 1965 when new owners purchased the property and hired Florida architect Robert Opsel to finish the project. Opsel was a student of Kelsey's at Catholic University and used Kelsey's plans to complete interiors of the existing buildings, but made several changes and additions that worked in harmony with the original design while providing updated facilities, 
with more streamlined modernist appearance. So this postcard from the 1960s shows several of those changes. Um, on the lodge's main entrance, he changed the roof line um, and added large glazed windows to the front gable. So you can see those here. Um, he converted the garage wing into guest rooms right here and changed the roof line. He added a new wing addition featuring a registration office and a flat roofed port cocher and additional guest units here and here. Other design changes included an open corridor, uh, the addition of private balconies. Oops, sorry. My notes got a little funny here. Um, sorry about that. Uh, and a pool to keep up with motel trends of the time. So you can see that pool here. Local tourism was still booming by the 1960s when the project was revitalized and Skyline Lodges Skyline Lodge, Skyline Lodge's secluded location on 75 acres allowed for a different lodging experience from those in-town hotels, as it offered resort-style amenities, including a resort or a, a restaurant, a swimming pool, hiking trails, an ice skating rink in the winter, tennis courts, and a private fishing lake. Now I'll show you a tour of what the property looks like today. The current owners have undergone a recent rehabilitation, but have maintained character defining features and historic integrity remains very high as you'll see. So I just wanna point out some of these wings before we look at photos. This is the Kelsey guest wing, which is part of that original design. Here's the main lodge, the garage guest wing and service wing. Here you see that port cocher. And here is what they call the Opsal guest wing. Uh, which was part of that 1960s redesign. So starting at the south end, showing the rear of the lodge, the basement level lounge shown here was enclosed in 1969. And this portion of the terrace was enclosed as part of Opsal's renovation in the 1960s. This photo shows the north elevation of the Kelsey guest wing. And here you can see a glimpse of the balconies which span the entire east elevation and were added by Opsal. This is a better view of the courtyard with the Kelsey guest wing here to the left. The lodge entrance is here at the center and the redesigned garage guest wing to the right. And you can see here the stone um, edge of the 1960s pool is visible, but it has been filled in. So this is considered a non-contributing structure. This is a closer view of the lodge entrance in comparison to the original Kelsey design. This is the registration office and the port cocher. And then another view of that portion with part of the guest wing to the right. And this shows the north and east elevation of the Opsal guest wing, the west elevation of the Opsal guest wing. And here's the back of the garage guest wing. Uh, as you can see, the balcony railings were replaced as part of the rehabilitation, but they are similar to the historic configuration. And down here, you can see the circa 2000 hot tub pavilion, which is also a non-contributing structure. And this shows the back of that um, lodge uh, kitchen wing. And um, you can see here those cantilevered stone steps. And in 1969, a fire did cause damage to this, to this wing. Um, so it achieved its current appearance at that time. Some interior views, here's the lodge, some dining areas basement level club room, typical finishes in the Kelsey guest wing, and typical finishes in the Opsal guest wing. And here's the reception area. The nomination notes that there are no known other local hotels or motels that display the same level of Radian or modernist characteristics. Uh, Kelsey had one other commission locally, 
And that was the Highland, Bi Highlands Biological Station Museum, which was a WPA uh, building project erected in 1942. So these photos show that building. The nominated boundaries encompass approximately three acres following the tax parcel. Even though at one time the property contained almost uh, 75 acres, uh, it has been subdivided over time for residential development. And the nomination author determined that these tennis courts that you see here, uh, as well as a clubhouse, um, were they actually date between 1980 and uh, 2000. So they are not included because they were not historically uh, a part of the lodge property. In all, Skyline Lodge is locally significant under Criterion A in the area of entertainment and recreation and Criterion C in the area of architecture. And the two periods of significance are 1936 through 38 and 1965 through 72. So that's what I have for Skyline Lodge. Would you like me to move on to the central and southeastern region or should we take a break to discuss? I think, we'll, oh, I think we'll take um, comments and questions about Skyline first and maybe we'll actually, um, I know this is a little bit different from what we usually do, but because you're, you've got presentations in two different regions, we'll vote on Skyline and then we'll vote on your next set of presentations. Okay, sounds great. So thank you, Hannah. What a what a beautiful uh, lodge. I really I looked is. it up though, and it's almost as far as I would possibly drive in North Carolina from where I am. <laughs> Good but, weekend, long weekend trip. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, are I there, uh, Madam Chair? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I need to make uh, uh, an announcement here. I will need to uh, excuse myself uh, from eleven to twelve, but I will return. Okay. That's okay. Yes, that's fine. Thank okay. you. Um, and I will, we may be breaking for lunch around the time that you would be able to, to rejoin us. Um, so I will okay. um, make a note to send you an email for when we're um, breaking for lunch. Okay. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Denard. Hannah, you were going to ask if you should close oh, the presentation. Yes. For, should I do that? Or would yeah, you like to keep it up? I think close it because it's a little bit easier to see everyone. But if anybody wants to point anything out specific out, we can ask you to pull it back up. Um, are there any comments or questions for Hannah about the Skyline Lodge? Josie. I have a comment, which is just that I really enjoyed this nomination. And I thought Section 8 made a really strong case that the wife of Arthur Kelsey, Charlotte Peabody, was truly a, a co-designer and collaborator. Um, and I think she ought to be named throughout section seven in the introduction of this project as a co-designer. A trap of architectural history is preferring that there's an individual typically male designer and overlooking female collaborators. And I don't think that's earned here. I think she's warranted um, to be named. And I, there, there was a lot of information that I was trying to, to um, provide you all with this uh, uh, presentation in a short amount of time. But yes, I, um, uh, Kelsey's wife, I don't recall her name at this time. Did, Charlotte Peabody. Uh, okay, she, she did um, design those terraces, as I understand it. So um, thank you for, for mentioning that. And Jesse. she's also mentioned as the most direct link that the two had to Frank Lloyd Wright and to his designs. Um, so she's actually, in terms of why the, the site is being nominated, the most direct link um, to him as well. Thank you for that, Josie. Other comments or questions? No. Is there a motion to um, approve and put forward the Skyline Lodge for the National Register? Dr. Johnson, I so move. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. Is there a second? I second. Uh, who, uh, uh, yeah, Mr. Burke Stone, thank you. <laughs> um, all right, we will move into our roll call vote. And I'm just gonna, um, I'm gonna follow our screen here. Um, Mr. Patch. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Alicia McGill, I vote yes. Uh, Mr. Jorgensen. 
Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Belladin. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Um, Dr. Denard. I vote yes. Thank you. Um, and we already have Dr. Johnson, Ms. Ward. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ruffin. Yes. Dr. Brothers. Yes. And uh, I think that's all of us. So um, the, uh, that's uh, unanimous. So now we will have um, Hannah move into her um, set of presentations for the central and southeastern regions. And you have four, is that correct? Okay, correct. cool. Yes. Um, and with, with these, unless you anticipate significant like debate or um, discussion, I think we'll just have you go through the, the slate of presentations um, and we'll vote at the end of all of those. So oh, sounds good. thank you. Share my screen again. Okay. okay, so starting off the National Register nominations for the Central and Southeastern region is the Aurora Cotton Mill Finishing Plant and Baker Kamek Hosiery Mills Plant. It was added to the state study list in February of 2021. Located in Central Almance County in the city of Burlington, its position in the, in the uh, city is located here by the Red Star. The Aurora Cotton Finishing Plant and Baker Kamek Hosiery Mills Plant is locally significant under Criterion A in the area of industry as part of a finite class of resources, which has an outsized impact on Burlington's, which had an outsized impact on Burlington's economy and physical growth. The period of significance begins in 1906 when the first portion of the building was erected and continues to 1972. Although the plant's industrial function continued after 1972, that period is not of exceptional significance. So before detailing the property's history, let's look at a current aerial view. Um, this is East Webb Avenue here and industrial buildings historically associated with Aurora Cotton Mills are located on both sides of the street with some of the earliest buildings outlined here in yellow um, to the east of East Webb Avenue. However, uh, for reasons I'll explain in a little bit, the nomination boundaries only include the portion outlined here in red. The textile industry was paramount in Burlington from the late 19th through the late 20th century, and the nominated plant was associated with two of Burlington's primarily, primary textile manufacturers. Aurora Cotton Mills began operating on the east side of East Webb Avenue in 1882 and expanded west across the street with a frame office and opening room in, during the 1890s. The company produced gingham fabrics and was owned by one of North Carolina's most successful textile families, the Holtz. Aurora Cotton Mills increased its finishing capacity in 1906 by erecting the two-story brick plant that is the earliest portion of the nominated facility. So that is shown here by the red square. Between 1918 and 1924, the finishing plant was enlarged to the south with a two-story brick addition. So here's a photo from 1940 showing the 1906 portion to the right and the circa 1920s portion in the background. Aurora Cotton Mills was Burlington's largest textile manufacturer through the 1920s and by 1928 produced rayon blend fabric. However, the Great Depression caused Aurora Cotton Mills to reduce production and it closed a few years later. In 1936, Baker Kamek Hosiery Mills acquired and updated the former finishing plant while Century Hosiery Mills Inc established in 1937, acquired much of the former Aurora Cotton Mill co complex on the east side of East Webb Avenue, then merged with Standard Hosiery Mills in 1947. Baker Kamek constructed additions to their plant in 1936, 46, 51, and the early 1960s to bolster production capacity and more than doubled its building footprint. 
They supplied the U.S. military with men's socks during World War II, and production increased after its 1953 merger with Baker Mebbin Hosiery Mills. The sock market remained strong, employment remained high, building improvements continued, and production escalated through the 1970s. Pickett Hosiery Mills purchased Baker Kamek, the Baker Kamek plant in 1982 and continues to operate today. The nominated boundary was drawn to exclude remaining, the remaining portion of the former Aurora Mills complex on the east side of East Webb Avenue as its functional connection to the nominated property was severed in 1936 when Baker Kamek Hosiery Mills acquired and updated the finishing plant. The boundary is drawn to encompass 1.8 acres of the 2.79 acre tax parcel, excluding the west portion of the parcel that once contained two mill houses and is now a parking lot. Furthermore, demolitions of portions of the east complex began in February of 1906, or sorry, of 2006. Um, here you can see that portion of the complex fronting East Webb, Ave, East Webb Avenue in 1909, and note here the location of the stair tower. This is the same view of that property today. So as you can see, much of it has been demolished. This is another oblique view of that same property. The remaining buildings on East Webb Avenue's east side do not possess the requisite integrity for the National Register. The nominated resource, however, retains excellent integrity to convey its significance. So I'll show you around the exterior first, moving counterclockwise. Uh, this is that addition that was built circa 1920. Here's that original 1906 finishing plant. And uh, the 1946 addition, a 1951 addition, Here's a 1936 to 46 die house, and this boiler house um, is also a, a, a freestanding uh, structure, so it's a, a or freestanding building, so it's a contributing building. And then uh, there are two portions that were built in the early 1960s, the warehouse and the office. And there's also an incinerator from circa 1946, which is a contributing structure. Some photos of the interior. Here's the 1960s office. And these are some typical spaces in the rest of the complex. It's characterized by open plans, wood floors, structural systems with either heavy timber beams and chamfered posts or steel I-beams and posts. Here's some more photos showing the interior character. Industrial buildings were prevalent in Burlington, particularly textile mills, and our staff consulted with the National Park Service at the study list stage because we had some concerns as to whether this property might rise to the top with so many other uh, local facilities. Um, we were advised that because textile mills were so important to Burlington's history, all textile mills could potentially be significant if integrity was high enough. And the National Park Service gave preliminary feedback that this resource appeared to have the requisite integrity and significance. So in sum, the Aurora Cotton Finishing Plant and Baker Kamek Hosiery Mills Plant is locally significant under Criterion A in the area of industry with a period of significance from 1906 through 1972 and additionally, it should be noted that we have received CLG comment from the mayor of Burlington and the Burlington Historic Preservation Commission that they believe the property uh, meets criteria for listing. Next is the Dallas Historic District boundary increase. This nomination was partially funded by a certified local government grant from our office. It was added to the state study list in October of 2019 following the Dallas Architectural Survey update. The district is located in central Gaston County, um, and it was originally listed in the National Register in 1973, locally significant under Criterion C in the area of architecture and Criterion A in the area of politics and government with a period of significance extending from 1840 through 1900. 
boundaries were drawn to encompass the courthouse square and surrounding lots with predominantly commercial and residential properties in the center of town. The courthouse square was established in 1840s when Dallas was designated the county seat of the new, newly formed Gaston County. Dallas remained Gaston County's seat until 1911 when it moved to Gastonia, approximately four miles to the south. However, industrial development, specifically textile mills, continued to fuel Dallas's economy into the mid 20th century. The 1973 nomination is very short, as they tended to be back then, um, but discusses the district's Greek revival and late Victorian architecture, um, with much of the focus on the courthouse, which is shown here, and the Hoffman Hotel, shown here. The boundary increase is locally significant under Criterion C in the area of architecture, and adds resources west and north of the original district from the late 19th century through the mid 20th century, uh, reflecting a continuum of architectural development for the district as a whole. The resources of the boundary increase include nationally popular building styles that relate to, um, that are not present or underrepresented in the original district, yet relate to the historic architectural development of the community. The period of significance for the boundary increase begins circa 1880. The approximate date of the oldest resource, the John and Mary Pewitt House, and extends to circa 1971, the date of several contributing ranch houses that are among the last of this building type to be constructed in the area. The boundary increase is largely residential in character, although it includes three historic churches and a historic school. Building styles and influences include Gothic Revival and Italian 8. So this house, which is the oldest confirmed house in the district, um, it includes elements of both styles. Queen Anne style, Romanesque Revival, Colonial Revival, Classical Revival, Craftsman, Period Cottages, Minimal Traditional, modern, split levels with modernist detailing, ranches with modernist detailing, and ranches with colonial revival detailing. Due to the inclusion of the Dallas graded high school, which was national register listed individually in 2002, the district is also locally significant under criterion A for education. The boundary increase includes 97 contributing primary resources and 19 contributing, non-contributing primary resources. So the, district's incre the district increase area has very good integrity. The boundary was drawn to encompass a concentration of historic resources associated with the architectural significance from the period with a high degree of integrity while excluding areas with a concentration of resources dating after the period of significance or that have, um, resources from the period that have lost their historic integrity. So again, the Dallas Historic District boundary increase is locally significant under Criterion C in the area of architecture with a period of significance spanning 18, circa 1880 through circa 1971. Next is the Watkins Chapel AME Zion Church. And this nomination was also partially funded by a certified local government grant from our office. It was added to the state study list in October of 2016, following the Mooresville survey update. Located in Southern Iredell County in the town of Mooresville, here is its position north of downtown Mooresville indicated by the red star. Watkins Chapel AME Zion Church is locally significant under Criterion A in the area of African-American ethnic heritage and Criterion C in the area of architecture. The period of significance begins in 1942, the year the church was built and ends in 1964, the date of construction for the education wing, which you can see back here. It meets criteria consideration A for religious properties as it derives its primary significance from architectural distinction and historical importance. 
Watkins Chapel AME Zion Church was established during a period of explosive growth for the, nominee, for the denomination in the South and particularly in North Carolina. Mooresville's first AME Zion Church was established as early as the 1880s in a historically African-American area known as Slab Town. The first church was constructed along uh, School Street shown here, just north of the church's current location. And it was first known as Hill, Hills Chapel and renamed Watkins Chapel in 1897. As detailed in the nomination, interviews with Miss Mary Eliza Jackson Burke Cofield, pictured here, inform much of what we know about Watkins Chapel's early history. Around 1889, Miss Cofield's father, Reverend Samuel William Jackson, became the preacher at three AME Zion churches in and around Mooresville, including what would become Watkins Chapel. In 1891, three AME Zion church trustees purchased a new parcel of land for the church in its current location. Ms. Cofield worked to support construction of the frame church and established the first Sunday school locally for African-Americans there. The current church was built in 1942, and although the nomination uh, acknowledges it might be possible the earlier frame church um, was remodeled uh, with, with brick. In 1964, Miss, uh, the, the Eliza Burke Christian Education Wing was completed and de dedicated in Miss Cofield's honor. Watkins Chapel is a Romanesque revival church with characteristic masonry exterior, round-headed windows and towers. However, the nomination argues that its architectural significance lies in the several aspects of its evolution and of form that are characteristic of older African-American congregations in North Carolina and the South. These characteristics include the rebuilding of earlier frame churches with masonry as resources and funding allowed, the use of twin crenellated towers, uh, a common building form found in buildings for historically African-American uh, congregations, uh, as well as the interior plan, which I'll discuss in a moment. Before that, I'll show you a tour of the building. Overall, the material integrity remains very high. A few notable material changes include limited application of vinyl siding and re replacement entry doors. Here's the other side of the church. And this shows some um, better views of the concrete block, the rear of the concrete block uh, education wing. So another notable feature is the auditorium style plan that reinforced the emphasis on preaching and music with the inclusion of a larger stage with a central pulpit and a choir seating. So here, here you can see that on the plan. And I also wanna note um, the plan of the education wing. There's a large uh, fellowship room uh, sort of surrounded by some smaller offices and kitchen and restrooms. Here you can see that central pulpit and the choir loft. Uh, the, beadboard, the beadboard wainscoting is a later change from an unknown date but the ecclesiastical furniture, the chancel rail, and the light fixtures are all original. Here are some views of that rear education wing. The nomination author looked at seven, a seven county region for comparison AME Zion church properties and identified 19 extant churches surveyed by our office with nearly half located in Mecklenburg County finding Watkins Chapel as the only surveyed AME Zion Church property in, in, in Iredell County. They determined Moore's Chapel AME Zion Church in Lincolnton to be the closest comparison to Watkins Chapel, as it too was a 19th century con congregation that rebuilt its church with brick in 1941. The front gabled building is flanked by twin crenellated towers, although this one has uh, Gothic revival style detailing. The boundary includes most of the property historically associated with the church building, excluding roughly 350 square feet along the northern boundary of the tax parcel, 
where an outbuilding of a neighboring parcel encroaches, which you can see here. The nominated boundary also includes a non-contributing shed built circa 2006 and a non-contributing carport built circa 1990. There was a circa 19, 1891 parsonage on the property, but it was demolished in the early 1990s. And directly east of the church property is an African-American cemetery that was apparently not associated with the church. So that has been left out of the boundary as well. In sum, Watkins Chapel AME Zion Church is locally significant under Criterion A in the area of African-American ethnic heritage and Criterion C in the area of architecture with a period of significance spanning 1942 through 1964. Additionally, it should be noted that we have received CLG comment from the mayor of Mooresville and the Mooresville HPC that they believe the nomination meets criteria for listing. And my final presentation for you all today is the Asheboro Downtown Historic District. It was placed on the state study list in February of 2019. Located in the Randolph County seat of Asheboro, the nominated district is locally significant under Criterion A in the areas of commerce, industry, politics and government, and social history, as well as Criterion C for architecture. The district encompasses four properties previously listed in the National Register, the Randolph County Courthouse, Sunset Theater, Ashboro Hodgery Mills, and Cranford Furniture Company Complex, and the Acme McCrary Hodgery Mills Complex. Because of the inclusion of the previously listed courthouse, the areas of politics and government and social history are added areas of significance. The period of significance begins in 1903, the completion date of two of its olding, oldest buildings, pictured here, and ends in 1972. Although Ashboro's business and local government continued to operate after 1972, the period after that time was not found to be of exceptional significance. This intact and cohesive early to mid 20th century commercial, industrial, and institution, in, into institutional buildings um, also including a church and two residential buildings, manifests the community's industry-driven commercial expansion from the early 20th century through the 1970s. Asheboro has been a regional business hub since its 1796 founding to serve as Randolph County's governmental seat. The town experienced major growth following its connection to the larger trading centers via the High Point, Randleman, Ashboro, and Southern Railroad Line, completed in July of 1889. In 1909, county leaders decided to build a new courthouse just east of the, the railroad, and law offices sprang up around it. While early industry focused on lumber and wood products, by the 1920s, textiles had become the dominant economic driver. The Ashboro Hodgery Mills and Cranford Furniture Company made additions and improvements to its complex through the 1940s, and the Acme McCrary Hosiery Mills grew through the 1970s. During these years, two mill complexes were surrounded by a variety of commercial buildings that catered to the needs of res residents. These included retail shops, professional offices, restaurants, and entertainment venues, all constructed along Sunset Avenue, Church, Fayetteville, North, and Worth Streets, and intersecting roads through the mid-20th century. In the 1960s and early 70s, a number of regional banks invested in downtown Asheboro as a banking center, building a strong collection of modernist style office buildings, many designed by local architects, including J. Hyatt Hammond, John James Croft Jr. and Alvis O. George Jr. George also designed the 1964 Asheboro Public Library for which he received an AIA North Carolina Design Award. Buildings in the district exhibit nationally popular architectural types and styles from the early to mid 20th century, including Italianate, Classical Revival, Georgian Revival, Art Deco, Art Moderne, Spanish Revival, 
craftsman, modernist, and brutalist. Ash the Ashboro Downtown Historic District has 92 resources that contribute to its significance. Only 14 of the 106 total resources are non-contributing. So there is a very high degree of historic integrity overall. The boundaries include approximately 46.49 acres and are drawn to encompass the most intact and cohesive collect, co concentration of historic commercial, institutional, and industrial buildings in the downtown area. Vacant and parking lots and adjacent properties that differ, differ in character, lack integrity, or were erected after the period of significance were excluded from the district. So and all the nominated district is located is locally significant under criterion A in the areas of commerce, industry, politics and government and social history, as well as criterion C for architecture with a period of significance spanning 1903 through 1972. Thank you, Hannah, excuse me. Um, if you want to go ahead and close your presentations. Um, sure. I, I noticed that um, Dr. Brian has joined us. Welcome, Dr. Brian. Uh, and uh, I am going to, before we go into discussion of the properties, I'm going to ask Dr. Brian to introduce herself, but also I need to know when you joined, signed on, so we can determine which um, presentations you can vote on. <laughs> you are muted. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Good. Uh, I'm Mary Lynn Bryan. I'm from Fayetteville. And um, I heard the presentations beginning with the Watkin, the Watkins Chapel. Okay. That's so when I know. First three, I cannot vote on. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to, to confirm. Um, but welcome. We're, we're glad to, to have you here. So, um, we will open it up for comments and questions about the presentations, and then when we vote, we will ha have uh, take a vote for the for, um, for the first two, and then we'll take a vote for the second two. Um, I have a question, um, and it's more just for my education. It doesn't have any bearing on my decision here, but the Watkins Chapel. So I'm curious in the process. That little notch out for the encroaching building from the other <laughs> yes. property. What's the decision process that's made to notch that out versus just include the entire tax parcel? And I guess that would mean that that becomes a non-contributing resource or something. It's, is there a threshold for this decision? All right. So this is something we've done in several other recent um, nominations to make sure that we don't include just half of a, a building. Um, so it's just a way to make sure that we're, we're cutting out anything that does not uh, relate to the property itself. Yes, related to that, I do have to say, I, I, having gone through a number of these, it surprises me how many times we see buildings that are either extending onto the next property, so you have to add a little, or things that are encroaching and you have to cut out. So it's, it surprises me that people can't figure out where property lines are. Right. It's something we have to look out for when we review these nominations. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Other comments or questions? I had a question about referring to Watkins Chapel as an auditorium plan versus just a standard nave and chancel. Is there, I didn't see that in the plan or description that really explained that. It's not an Akron plan with classrooms or anything, but that seemed like strange versus a bit more traditional plan for church. So, um... I'll tell you that I, I actually did not review this nomination. Um, it was reviewed by, by Jen before she left. Um, and I can tell you that, um, you know, any comments that we made, um, this, is, this is how the, the consultant um, decided to, to um, deal with those comments. So I understand your concern. Other comments or questions? No? All right, um, hearing none, is there a motion to approve uh, the 
first two presentations given by Hannah. So that was the Aurora Cotton Mills finishing plant and the Dallas Historic District boundary increase. This is David, I moved to approve both. Okay, thank you, David Bergstone. I'll second Matt Jorgensen. Thank you, Matt. Uh, all right, we will uh, go into our roll call vote then. Uh, Sean Patch. Yes. Thank you. Alicia McGill, yes. Fred Belladin. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Johnson. Yes. Thank you. Josie Ward. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Brothers. Yes. Thank you. Uh, and um, David Ruffin. Yes. Thank you. Um, so those are approved and um, now we can go into, is there a motion to approve the, the second two presentations? So that's the Watkins Chapel AME Zion Church and the Ashboro Downtown Historic District. Josie Ward, I'll move. Thank you. Is there a second? Hammer Brothers, I'll second. Great, thanks. Okay, now we'll move into the vote for those two. Um, Sean Patch. Yes. Thank you. Alicia McGill, yes. Matt Jorgensen. Yes. Thank you. Fred Belladin. Yes. Dr. Johnson. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bergstone. Yes. Dr. Bryan. Yes. And Mr. Ruffin. Yes. All right, thank you, that's great. Um, I think that this is a, a good time for us to take a quick break. Um, so our, our morning break, and then we have four more presentations before the study list presentation. So we'll kind of assess then um, our lunch break. So um, we'll say a 10 minute break since remote meetings are exhausting. And um, so come back at 11, 35 because 1133 sounds like an awkward time. So we'll say 1135 um, and stay in the meeting if you can and just mute yourselves and turn off your, your video. All right.
tight for a moment. Is it just me? Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much. Do I need to repeat any of that? I understand that folks haven't heard anything um, oh. Claudia <laughs> has said. <laughs> so, so do you want me to start here? Yes, I think so. I'm sorry. Thank you. All right. Um, the Black Ox Duplan Corporation Mill um, has, as you can see, has seen better days. And it's not photogenic, but it does have an interesting, important local history that's conveyed by the nomination's very thorough statement of significance. I should add that it's also difficult to photograph because the topography is situated in a shallow and rather tight, at the bottom of a shallow and rather tight bowl. Uh, the nomination was prepared by CRM firm Richard Grubbin Associates staff, Jason Harp, and Annie McDonald, the former preservation specialist in our Western office. The factory is in the heart of Lincolnton, just a couple of blocks from the courthouse and the central dis business district, as seen in these two images. The mill is circled in red in the, uh, this recent aerial photograph, and the courthouse is right down here. So you can see it's really just a block from the the edge of the central business district. In this closer aerial at above left, multiple construction phases can be detected as well as the serious deterioration of the earliest portion of the building and a 1947 addition. So this is the earliest portion here. And here, this, was, this aerial was taken a few years ago. It still had the monitor roof and that's where the failure began. And eventually it took most of the roof with it. Um, then in 1929, an addition was built. It did have a monitor roof and that was removed quite a while ago. 1947, a very large addition was constructed here. And also this area at the north end of the original portion of the mill. And then in 1955, this wing and, and these uh, little additions were constructed, this and this along here. So uh, five major phases of construction. And here you can clearly identify the phases with the help of the site plan uh, depicting the um, building's development. Fortunately, most of the mill is in good condition and it's a high degree of integrity representing its historic period. Through multiple phases of ownership into the 1940s, uh, the mill was known locally as the Black Ox Mill. The earliest portion of the mill was constructed in 1920 by D.C. Williams, who took advantage of the explosive demand for textiles uh, following World War I, a ready labor force in the heavily rural county, and abundant raw materials to establish the Williams Cotton Company. And this uh, 1920s Sanborn map shows the mill recently constructed. So this portion uh, survives. All of these uh, additions or wings uh, were removed through later phases of construction. Textile market volatility resulted in the 1922 sale of the property to the XL Manufacturing Company, which was organized by several prominent Lincoln industrialists including members of the locally prominent Childs family. Excel not only spun cotton, but also wove bedspreads in the facility, requiring greater square footage that prompted the construction of a large one-story addition around 1929. So here's the addition. I've, I've sort of slanted this, these images, the Sanborn map of 1929. Uh, so you can read it with this, um, it's really wonderful that we have these documentary photos. So this is the Ninth Circuit 1929 edition. And back here is the original portion, the 1920 mill. When constructed, the east and west walls were brick to the level of the windows. Um, you can see over here. And um, above that, they were framed and filled with large pairs of the windows. The south wall was framed and clad in weatherboard with smaller individual window openings. Uh, like the original section of the mill, it featured a large monitor running most of the length of the roof. The exterior of the one-story circa 1929 edition is now mostly hidden 
by the 1947 edition and is visible only on the east elevation along here today. The windows of the east elevation, as you'll see when we, I take you around the building, were removed and the exterior finished with brick laid in common bond sometime after 1947 and probably prior to 1960. Defaulting on its debts in the late 1930s, the XL Manufacturing Company became the property of the Childs family, and they ultimately sold the Black Ox Mill to the Pennsylvania-based Duplan Corporation in 1944. Duplan's acquisition of the mill enabled the company to increase production of rayon thread, which was critical to the manufacture of finished goods, including hosiery, and during World War II, the production of military textiles such as parachutes. Duplan used the plant for three years before significantly expanding the building in 1947 with an addition wrapping around the side and rear of the earlier construction and the addition more than doubled the production space. Though only one story tall, it rests on a poor concrete foundation with a finished basement level that is partially exposed due to a slight decline in the grade elevation on the south and west ends of the property. So here you can see they're building, this is you know, the basement level here, they were starting construction, the 1929 section in the back and the original 1920 mill right here. And this, was, this shed wing right here was later taken off. And here it's coming up, they're starting to build the first floor and here it is um, just about finished. The addition is of load-bearing concrete block Two smaller additions were built at the north end of the original section and on its east side, they're also of concrete block. And also at the same time, they added this water tower and the small pump house. So everything that's shaded it in yellow. This expansion was a significant event in the company's operations. For by 1947, the Lincolnton plant was the only facility across all of the company's mills that spun rayon. Labor disputes at its northern plants led the Duplan Corporation to relocate its offices to Charlotte in 1953, from which it continued to operate the Lincoln plant. In the mid 1950s, Duplan again enlarged the building, constructing an addition to house management offices and an expanded shipping department. It's here. And then this also, this smaller addition right here. A reorganization of the company's production and distribution in the summer of 1956 led to the closure of the Lincolnton facility in 1957. In 1961, Duplan sold the property to Hudson Hosiery Mills, which used the plant until 1969, when it was transferred to hosiery producer um, Chad Bourne Inc. The property has been vacant for more than 20 years. And um, which, of course, led to the deterioration of this whole section. And um, this roof looks like it's pretty bad shape, too. So um, now I'm going to walk you around the outside of the mill clockwise, starting at the northeast corner here. The portion of the mill closest to us is the 1947 edition. The smaller of the, of the 1947 editions right here. So uh, this photo, you can see the water tank and the pump house. It's, this is photo two. Continuing around, we're turning around, we're looking this way, photo three. Photo four, we're looking back. And um, this is an air handling unit. And there, this is the foundation of a cooling tower that was removed. And then photo five is taken from here. We're looking back here, you can see another air handling unit. And this, so this, um, this is the original mill. This is the circa 1929 edition. You can see where it was framed, it's all been bricked over. And then this is the east side of the 1947 edition right here. Continuing around, we're looking at the back of the 47 edition. And this 
photo is looking back at this direction. Um, this red brick is the back of this um, 1955 edition. And here we're looking from this spot back towards those 1955 editions. And right here is the edge of this 1955 edition. And here's a view of it uh, from the front of the building. This was the, um, had offices in the first story and also a shipping department. Now I'm gonna show you some views of the interior, beginning with the most deteriorated area that's shown in upper left. And this photo is taken from standing this right here, looking across into the 1920, uh, original portion of the mill. And where these red lines are drawn, this is where the wall that was the north end of that original portion of the mill was taken out when this 1947 edition was constructed. So when the monitor failed, you know, originally we're standing on the first floor and here the roof and all of the, uh, the floor, the second floor has fallen in. Uh, in the 1920 section. Here, fortunately, the steel structural system survives in the 1947 edition, as well as a little bit of the flooring, the decking uh, of the roof and also at the second story. This is looking at upper right there. Uh, this photo is taken from approximately here at the end of the arrow, looking north through the 1929 edition with the original portion of the mill back here. And here, these are photos. This is the first story of the 1947, the big 47 edition. It's taken from approximately here, looking back this way. And this is uh, the basement of the 47 edition. And here, interior photos of the larger uh, 1955 wing, the first story, which had offices. And this is looking at the basement here, the lower left, lower right. Um, like most counties in the Piedmont region, textile manufacturing was a dominant industry in Lincoln County from the late 1800s through the mid 1900s. Most of the county's textile mills are gone with many demolished during the late 1900s and early 2000s. Of all of the mills constructed in Lincoln County beginning in the early 19th century, only 15 survived into the mid to late 20th century. And today, the Black Ox Duplan Corporation Mill is one of only eight mills that remain extant in the county and one of only three in Lincolnton. The other two Lincolnton mills are shown here. At upper left is the Eureka Mill, which was listed in the National Register in 2013. And since then, additions built within its period of significance have been removed. And you can see um, where the addition was here. And there was one on the other side too, it's gone. The other mill is the Daniel Mill, shown at the bottom. I'm not sure of its date. And it's been extensively altered and, um, altered and now has a contemporary appearance. The Black Ox Duplan Corporation Mill embodies the evolution of the textile industry from the production of cotton to rayon and other synthetics, as well as the changing nature of corporate business practices in response to the volatile economics and labor market from the early 1900s through the third quarter of the 20th century, despite the deterioration of the Northeast portion of the mill. When, can, when this is perceived, when the mill is perceived in the exterior, the four periods of construction still communicate the building's evolution over time and its significance from the period of 1920 to 1957. The damage to the interior of the 1920 section is undeniably significant, yet the building's use as a cotton textile plant is still embodied by the circa 1929 edition constructed by the Excel Manufacturing Company which followed similar design principles in construction of the one-story extension to the two-story mill. 
and the 1947 construction, the largest portion of the plant, is highly intact and represents a significant shift to the production of synthetics. The Black Ox Duplan Corporation Mill is nominated for the National Register at the local level under Criterion A in the area of industry for its significant association with the industrial development of Lincolnton and Lincoln County. The property's period of significance begins in 1920, the construction date of the oldest portion of the mill, and ends in 1957 when the Duplan Corporation shifted its production of rayon to other plants and closed the Lincolnton Mill. While the Hudson Hosiery Mill operated the plant from 61 to 69, followed by Chadburn Inc. until 1981, the period from 61 to 81 is not considered historically significant as it coincides with the general decline in textile manufacturing across the Piedmont region. Thank you, Claudia. Yeah, and we can just move into the other two. We'll do okay. discussion and questions at the end. All right, this is gonna take me a minute. Sorry. So I'm moving to the Southern Railway car at the North Carolina Transportation Museum. If I can get it to open. There we go. Okay. Totally different kind of property. One that we rarely see these meetings. This is the Southern Railway passenger car number 1211, located at the North. We can't see your presentation yet. Oh, shoot. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. There we go. Yep. All right, you see this? So uh, the Southern Railway passenger car number 1211 is located at the North Carolina Transportation Museum, formerly the Southern Railway shops in the Northeastern Rowan County town of Spencer. Here on the left, you can see the boundaries of the 1978 National Register listing for Spencer shops, circled in left and in, in red. And that nomination prepared when the property stood derelict before acquisition by the state of North Carolina did not include any rolling stock. And the passenger car that's presented today, familiar, familiarly known, sorry, as a Jim Crow car, is the subject of a National Park Service civil rights grant that requires the car to be listed in the National Register. The aerial view on the right, uh, in this view, you can see the roundhouse where the car is stored, usually in one of the circled stores, uh, stalls in the Northeast half of the roundhouse, shown here. And this is the car, and here it is again here. The car is a long distance heavyweight steel partitioned passenger coach built in 1917 by the Pullman Company as Southern Railway passenger car number 1563. Evidence strongly suggests that the car was partitioned in 1939, the same year it was air conditioned to comply with Jim Crow car laws that had been enacted. Records of the partitioning of this car have not been found, but around 1940, Partitions have become the industry standard for newly built cars, and there is documentation of the partitioning in 1940 of Southern Railway car number 1200, which, also, which was built in 1918 and is now in the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. In 1953, during a complete overhaul, which resulted in its current appearance, 
Southern Railway renamed the car, uh, this car at the transportation exam, number 1211. The upper image is a 1918 plan of the car as it was originally built without a partition. It included a men's smoking lounge with leather seats down here. The lower image is a 1952 plan showing the car as it was configured when it was sent to Southern Railway shop, Railways shops in Spartanburg to be overhauled with the partition already in place. And this is where I inserted this red line. This is where the partition is located. So it was already here when it was sent to be overhauled. The bulkhead at the back of the men's lounge, right here is the men's lounge, uh, towards the middle of the car, uh, serves as the partition. And then there's a door here, the rest of the partition. The major overhaul in 1952 to 53 occurred the same year that Southern Railway fully transitioned from Steve loco uh, steam locomotives to diesel locomotives. During the overhaul, almost all the car's components were replaced, including the siding, seats, flooring, vestibule doors, end doors, and windows. There's some uh, uncertainty has existed around which seating area in car number 1211 was assigned to white passengers as opposed to black passengers. But Tyler Trahan, a researcher at the North Carolina Transportation Museum, contends that the opposite is, um, it's com well, it's commonly assumed that the seating area next to the small toilet rooms down at this end uh, was for the black passengers. But Tyler Trahan, a researcher at the North Carolina Transportation Museum, contends that the opposite is true and that the seating area in car number 1211 with the small, pass, uh, small toilets was for white passengers. He points to plans for several Southern Railway cars that were built by the Pullman Company in the early 1940s that were manufactured as segregated coaches. And their plans with the segregated areas clearly labeled show the larger toilet facilities with saloons. So uh, this in the women's lounge here, this outer portion's the saloon and then the toilet in here, and the same in the men's lounge, uh, the saloon here and the toilet area. Um, that these were located in the black seating area. Also, the North Carolina Transportation Museum research files contain an illustrated booklet published by Southern Railway that includes photographs of commodious women's and men's lounges in the black seating area of a passenger coach built in 1941 and explains that the Spartan accommodations, as they call them, were for white passengers because they were allowed to use smoking rooms and lounge space in the cars that followed. This information suggests that the white passengers sat in the smaller area, uh, smaller section of car 1211, while the larger area was for black passengers. And that's how is the car is treated in this nomination. Car number 1211 retains its 1917 undercarriage and two six-wheel cast steel trucks with friction bearings, but most of the remainder of the car inside and out dates the 1953 renovation. With material from the latter date intact, except for the floor, which was replaced around 2019, and the seats, which were removed during an unknown period, the car retains a high level of integrity from the historic period. So now we're gonna take a tour of the car's interior. The image at the left is taken from the passage next to the door to the women's lounge. It's taken from right here, looking back this way. It's looking into the black passenger seating area and the image to the right is taken from just beyond the women's lounge from right here. You can see a storage area in the men's lounge projecting from the middle ground. There's a storage area for luggage and um, it's, this is an entrance right here, goes into the men's lounge. The black passenger area 
is a little over 23 feet long, not including the service alcove at the end or the men's and women's lounges. The upper image is taken in the saloon of a women's lounge, and this is the door into the toilet. The left image shows the water alcove in the black passenger seating area right here, behind uh, at the back of the men's lounge. So that's taken from right about here. And in this image, the passage on the left goes through a doorway marking the partition and it continues into the white seating area beyond. So these are views in the white section. The lower left photo is taken from the middle of the seating area, right here, looking back this way, um, towards the small toilets at the end of the car, one of which is shown at the upper left. The photo at lower right is taken from the middle of the white seating area, looking back in the other direction this way. And uh, just ignore the toilets that have been placed here temporarily. So this is the bulkhead at the back of the men's lounge in the black passenger area. And then this photo is taken from right here. Um, also, as I said, it's looking back to the back of the toilet area. Ceilings are sheathed in masonite and ply metal, which is the trade name for plywood bonded with rust resistant alloy steel, covers the side walls between the sheet metal kick plate and the bottom of the molding under the luggage racks. Formica covers the end walls except for sheet metal sheaths, the bottom skirt. The commercial vinyl tile floor is a circa 19, uh, 2019 edition that replaced the 1953 gray and red rubber tile. The nomination presents a thorough discussion of Jim Crow car laws and their impact on black railroad travelers to support the car's significance in the areas of social history and black ethnic heritage. Following the end of reconstruction, racial discrimination became institutionalized. And in the 1880s, Southern states began to adopt laws to separate the races in railroad cars. While the restrictions varied from state to state, all of the laws stated that railway companies carrying passengers had to provide equal but separate accommodations for whites and blacks by providing two or more passenger coaches for each train or by dividing passenger coaches by a partition. This stipulation was in, in accordance with Plessy v. Ferguson, which centered around a black Louisiana train passenger, Homer Plessy, who was jailed for taking a seat in a white coach. North Carolina's railroad car law was passed in March 1899, a few months after the Wilmington race riot of 1898, at the height of the white supremacy campaign. Initially, Southern Railway passengers, uh, passenger cars that were traveling through the South were partitioned in some manner, but soon most of their trains, because they traveled through and beyond the South, designated separate cars for whites and blacks. And there is ample evidence that the cars designated for blacks rarely were equal to those for whites. Starting in the late 1930s, the Pullman Company began producing cars with the partitions already installed, and older cars began to be retrofitted with partitions. In 1955, the Federal Interstate Commerce Commission ordered an end to racial segregation on interstate trains but it wasn't enforced in the states until 1961 when Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy petitioned the ICC to do so. Southern Railway complied and desegregated its cars. Car number 1211 and probably most if not all of its partition cars remained a two compartment car, however. After Southern Railway retired car number 1211 in 1969, the company donated the coach to the National Railway Historical Society's Atlanta, Atlanta chapter. In 1980, the North Carolina Railroad purchased it and donated it to the North Carolina Transportation Museum. Passenger car number 1211 is significant at the local level under criterion A 
in the areas of social history and Black ethnic heritage. <clears throat> Excuse me, as a largely intact example of a partitioned railroad passenger coach associated with the Jim Crow era of rail travel in the Southern United States. Although built in 1917, car number 1211 underwent remodeling in 1939 and 1953, and therefore more accurately reflects the form and materials of a partitioned passenger coach from those times. The period of significance for this artifact of Jim Crow segregation begins circa 1939, the year it was most likely partitioned, and ends to circa 1961, the year Southern Railway likely ceased segregating passengers. To depict the transition from a standard Pullman Company railroad car to one altered to comply with laws in place in the geographic area where it operated. And I might add that the passenger car was many, one of many that were operated by the railroad. And information about the specific car, including the routes it traveled in the vast Southern Railway system, remains largely unknown. The only specific mention of routes is in maintenance records of February 1955, which indicates that the car that indicate the car had been operating as a day coach on the Augusta Special, which began operating in 1915 and initially offered service between Augusta, Georgia and Washington, DC. So that concludes my presentation. And Thank you. again, Thank you. it's gonna take me a minute. the larger file, which takes a few minutes, a couple minutes to open. Still opening. Sorry, in the future, if I make these presentations again, I very well might do it in June. I'll have all three of my presentations strung together in, as one. So we won't have to do this. Okay, can you see that? Shoot. Yep. All right. I'm still seeing the railway car. I know. I'm okay. trying to close it. Okay, here we go. You see that? Yes. Okay, good, thank you. So my last presentation is of the Pilot Mountain Downtown Historic District. Pilot Mountain is in East Central Surrey County as shown by the red star on the left map. On the right, taken from HPO web, you see Pilot Mountain's downtown area. Two individual properties, uh, that have been listed in the National Register are outlined in blue. The Pilot Mountain Hosiery Mill over here, uh, which you approved last year, and the Bank of Pilot Mountain here, which was listed in 1970, uh, 1997 and included was included in this district. The green lines encompass the district when it was placed on the study list about 16 years ago. The district I'm presenting today is larger, embracing additional resources that are now more than 50 years old or are older and have been remodeled more than 50 years ago. This map shows the district's resources. There are 41 buildings, 38 primary resources and three secondary. Of these, 29 are primary contributing resources. And there are also three sites, all of which are secondary resources. One is a contributing site. It's a gathering spot in front of the post office here. 
right here. And then there are two non-contributing pocket parks created from former drive-through or parking areas. One is here and the other is in here. And um, if these secondary resources are included are part of a tax parcel with the primary resource, it's not indicated on this map. And this is the, um, the red star indicates the Bank of Pilot Mountain that's individually listed. So the percentage of contributing resources, 75% of the total resource count and 76% of the primary resources. And I should note that there were some, a few errors regarding the resource count at the beginning of the narrative description and they have been corrected since the nomination was sent to you. So here the district is outlined in this aerial group. And again, the red, um, here's the individually listed bank of Pilot Mountain. And the bank is shown here with the distinctive summit in the background, a few miles to the south that gave the town its name. The town of Pilot Mountain took shape at the end of the 19th century, after the 1988 completion of the Cape Fear and Yadkin Valley Railroad, which linked Wilmington and Mount Airy to the Northwest. The town incorporated in 1889. The railroad and the presence of six mineral springs resorts in the region helped the little town support typical businesses. Livery stables, general stores, blacksmiths, tobacco factories, boarding houses, and at least one hotel. In the early 20th century, the town gained a school, electricity, a library, and a movie theater. The photo at top left is dated 1891, and the other two were taken in the first decade of the 20th century. The success of textile mills in Pilot Mountain and the surrounding area contributed to the growth of the town's business district through the middle of the last century, despite the bypassing of Highway 52 in the 1940s. By 1970, the end of the district's period of significance Downtown Pilot Mountain was as active and prosperous as it had been 50 years earlier, with more than 15 stores, a half dozen restaurants, barber and beauty shops, the offices of insurance agents, optometrists, lawyers, and doctors, a newspaper, and three banks. In 1970, Farmers Bank, located in the downtown since its establishment in 1920, signaled its faith in the continued viability of the Central Business District with the completion of its new facility at 110 West Main Street. So here you can see it, the streetscape, and here is a view of it. You see the two primary facades. Development grew increasingly dense around the principal main and depot intersection in the early 20th century, as shown on Sanborn maps from the period. But there were always a few undeveloped lots. Those shown as vacant on that uh, resource map I showed you a few min minutes ago. These lots played a role in the commercial life of the town. The unbuilt spaces beside and behind buildings were used for support functions. For example, the use of a vacant lot beside a high hardware store for the display of heavy farm equipment. And after World War II, unbuilt areas provided parking and drive-through lanes for downtown businesses. So um, this is a, another bank. It's not. It's built after the period of significance, um, but you can see um, this uh, drive-through and parking behind. Um, this is the drive-through next to the um, Farmers Bank I showed you a moment ago, and here is another area that's always been vacant. The various styles of commercial architecture of each decade between circa 1900 and 1970 are represented in the district. The modernist Farmers Bank is the most recent contributing building shown here at upper left, while the earliest are the individually listed Bank of Pilot Mountain of 1900, the bottom, and a few buildings on the north side of the 100 block of West Main Street, including 129 West Main, 
to the right. Through 1940, construction normally was load-bearing brick and brick veneer thereafter. Most of the buildings constructed between the two world wars are standard commercial plans with minimal detailing. All of the buildings shown here have original or lightly modified storefronts. One of the larger and most architecturally distinctive buildings in the district is a 1927 sandstone veneered Smith building. Another stone veneered building is the former Pilot Mountain Post Office of 1915. The recessed area in front is the gathering place, the contributing uh, secondary uh, resource, contributing site that I mentioned a minute ago. The flanking buildings, the Badgett building to the left, uh, circa 1920, and the Swanson building of circa 1930, were de designed with the canted facades to frame the space. Construction and remodeling activity in the district from 1945 to 1970 illustrates the two basic small town stylistic strategies of the era, modernism and historicism, as well as the a-stylistic utilitarian approach. An example of the utilitarian approach is the 1948 J.K. Smith building at Upper Left. The town's first modernist building is the 1954 international style Blaylock professional building with brick and polished granite lined alcoves, which you see at upper right. The 1955 remodeling of the circa 1900 Napier building uh, and the 64 to 65 construction of the Stone Lawson building exhibit the influence of the international style. While modernism was at its height in Pilot Mountain in the 1960s, a few merchants reintroduced historicism to the downtown with such high profile projects as the newly constructed Max Coach House restaurant of 1964 to 65, and the remodeling of the Surrey Drug Company building facade, 1970. As these two buildings and the Stone Lawson building show, and as you'll see in the quick tour of the district I'm about to give you, a few original storefronts survive, but most date to the 50s and 60s, either because the buildings they built that they belonged to were built during that period or the storefronts were remodeled at that time. Several of the 1950s and 1960s storefronts are canted with entries at the most recessed end, or the storefronts are evenly recessed. The 1960s saw the introduction of closed storefronts with windows treated as openings and solid walls. A few storefronts of both types, open and closed, date to the post-historic period. Likewise, structural awnings, which predominate, date to both the historic and post-historic periods. Now I'm gonna give you a quick walk through the district and we'll start with a view of the south side of the 100 block of East Main Street, which is looking, this is sitting here uh, at this junction, looking down to the east. So this is the bank of Pilot Mountain. It's individually listed right here. And we're looking down to the very end of the district, this little building shown here. Um, this tiny restaurant was originally named a sandwich shop, and it's now named the Squeeze Box due to its small size. It's a popular local landmark built in 1952 to 53 that's virtually unchanged. Now we're going to go in the other direction, down the south side of West Main Street. At the top, you'll see the 1927 Smith Building in the foreground, and also in the um, and then in the far right background, uh, down here, the Farmer's Bank. And below, there's the edge of the Farmer's Bank, the side elevation, and a block of buildings in the middle with the PG Wall Store here, built in 1959, and then three brick buildings built between, uh, between the late 1930s and 1946. And in the background down here are two non-contributing buildings. These right here. So we're looking down this way. 
And then those two non-contributing buildings you can see in this top image. Uh, so we're standing here looking down to the end of the district on this side. Um, this is the current town hall that was built in the mid seventies. And then behind the two story former town offices and this building had its facade completely remodeled around 2000. The westernmost edge of the district are the one story late 1940s buildings in the background. And now turning around, we're going to go back down West Main Street to look at the buildings on the north side. And here in this view taken from right here. Continuing down West Main Street, the district ends on this side with a small one-story building uh, down here, uh, which has an angled, angled corner entrance. So looking down here from this view, and then from here. So this building is this building right here. And finally, uh, the buildings on South Depot Street and the one building on Marion Street. So these are the buildings on South Depot Street, looking down this way with the Blaylock building back here. This is called the big store. It's non-contributing because its facade was completely redone uh, fairly recently. That's right here. And then we have uh, two other buildings. This is a 1940s warehouse uh, behind the uh, Smith Guano and Hardware Store right here. And that hardware store is here. And then we have the former fire department, which is right here. So. The Pilot Mountain Downtown Historic District is significant at the local level under Criterion A in the area of commerce as the historic commercial heart of Pilot Mountain, Eastern Surrey County's principal trade and market center, encompassing a wide range of historic commercial building types associated with the trading of goods, services, and commodities. It's also eligible under Criterion C in the area of architecture for its inclusion of the majority of the downtown's intact historic commercial buildings, embodying distinctive characteristics of type, period, and method of construction, and representing a significant and distinguishable entity that includes key buildings of architectural and historical note. Period of significance ends from circa 1900, the approximate date of the earliest known surviving buildings, to 1970, uh, embracing modernist and historicist construction through 1970. Thank you so much, and Claudia. You want me to stop sharing? Yeah, unless people have questions about specific um, images, because it's just right, a little. Just, right. It's a little bit easier for us to see everybody if you close the presentation, and then people can request you pull it up if necessary. Okay. Uh huh. Thanks. Are there any questions or comments for Claudia? Yeah, this, this is Sean. I'd, I'd like to ask a question about the Black Ox Mill, specifically the integrity issue. That, that seems substantial to me. And I understand the rest of the mill is in fairly good shape. But my question is, if that portion of the mill were not there, does that affect the rest of the nomination for the rest of that building or that complex? Um. That's a very good question. And I should have said, should have explained um, two things. One is that uh, they recently had an engineering study done. And the engineers advised that if the exterior, the outer walls, um, both side walls uh, survive, if those walls are braced and um, then the interior that's ruinous can be removed and that the shell that remains uh, would be stable enough to have that interior reconstructed. So 
Um, the point being that from the exterior, that portion would remain. That it's not in danger of being lost, lost at this point. We also consulted with the National Park Service about this. And um, our reviewer told us that he thinks that considering so much of the rest of the mill is there and in good condition, that uh, the nomination of the entire building uh, could be successful. Thanks. Other questions or comments? One quick follow-up question on that. So if the outer walls that are to be braced fail or collapse for some reason, does that put the entire nomination at risk? Well, we can only deal in the present okay. and they're standing right now. So. And then one quick question on pilot mountain. Well, I'm sorry, are we going one at a time or are we covering all of the presentations? We, we can cover them all now. Okay. On pilot mountain, the section of main street past the one story building with the angled face. And I apologize, I might've missed this. That oh. block, the rest of that block is excluded for changes. Yeah. Yes, it's been, okay. uh, it's been very altered. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I should have said that. David Bergstone. I yeah, I just want to state how thrilled I am in the, in the Black Ox nomination to see the inline graphics to help describe sections of the building as they're being discussed in the nomination. I hope to see more of those or images. I like the historic images too and, and the you know the narrative. I think it helps incredibly to do these. I'm hoping you guys in the Park Service can encourage those to continue and be expanded on in the future. And yeah, that's credit for that. Here. Credit for that goes to Annie McDonald. She's responsible yeah, for that. And we thought that embedding those uh, images in the nomination was a great idea. Yeah, if we don't have to use typewriters, we have something else. So. <laughs> right, right. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I have one comment to add, um, sort of a late breaking comment that literally during the presentation, the um, for Pilot Mountain, the mail came in and we have received one notarized objection to the Pilot Mountain Historic District by a property owner in the district. You need, um, you need half of the property owners to stop nomination of a district um, to, to file these kinds of objections. So this is just one, but I did want to, um, I did want to acknowledge that because it's a little bit unusual to receive one of those. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for clarifying what, what that means for us. So, Any other comments or questions? Sarah, was there anything substantive in their objection or is it just a general? Uh, no, I can, I can read the whole thing. I am the sole owner of 103 West Main Street and uh, I object to the listing of my property being any part of the National Register of Historic Places in North Carolina and or the United States and uh, follows with a sentence asking to remove the property from any records about the district. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, for clarification, was that a contribute? Does it matter if that's a contributing resource? I, I don't think is that it? matters in any way. And I, I, don't, I don't know what specific it property is that is. It's contributing. So, 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 what is the, the 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 person's real objection? He just doesn't want to be included uh, in that, uh, or is that's, there some other? Uh, that's all the information he sub submitted is that he objects to listing um, in the register, and this will go with the nomination to the Park Service. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Other questions, comments, additions? Dr. McGill, I just want to acknowledge Dr. Denard has returned, but right. I'm, I'm not sure at what point he returned. That's, so I think we, we might need to ask for you to split up the vote. That's what I was going to just do next. Thank you okay. for, yeah. Um, 
I, I had noticed that Dr. Denard had joined us. I noticed it in the um, final presentation in the Pilot Mountain. Dr. Denard, did you, were you present for Claudia's um, first two presentations, the uh, uh, Black Ox? Uh, no, I, uh, I left on the Aurora Cotton Mills. Uh, now, I did read all of these, and I had indicated my notes uh, for a vote of approval, uh, if, that, if that means anything. Uh, but I did uh, come back in on the, uh, uh, the Pilot Mountain uh, part, right. uh, presentation, That's rather. Okay, for the purposes uh, of our, our vote today, my understanding is that we need to um, have you excluded from the first two presentations, but can have you vote on, on the final one. Am, am I correct on that, Ramona? Okay, it, it's, it's not something we normally have to work with, but I think when Dr. Bryan was not here for the right. earlier presentations, that's, that's how we decided to handle it, I believe. Yeah, okay, um, okay. Thanks. All right. So we will so we will vote on the first two presentations and then we will vote on on the last one. So is there um, a motion to approve the um, Black Ox presentation and the Southern Railway uh, passenger car? So move. Matt Jorgensen. OK, I think I caught Dr. Brian first and then we'll have uh, Matt Jorgensen as our second. second. All right, great, thanks. Um, and we'll um, go into our roll call vote. Alicia McGill, I vote uh, yes. Uh, Josie Ward. Yes. Thank you. Sean Patch. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Brothers. Yes. Thanks. Fred Belladin. Yes. Dr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Bergstone. Yes. And uh, Mr. Ruffin. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Great. Thank you. Um, and so now we will move to a vote. Well, um, is there a motion for the Pilot Mountain Historic District? I so move. Thank you to approve. Um, and is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. All right. So we'll move into the vote for those or for that. Um, Alicia McGill. Yes. Dr. Brian. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ward. Yes. Mr. Jorgensen. Yes. Dr. Brothers. Yes. Mr. Belladin. Yes. Dr. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Bergstone. Yes. Dr. Denard. Yes. And Mr. Ruffin, you were our... Yes. our yeah, thank you. I'm just making sure I correctly remembered. Okay, we <clears throat> we are close to lunchtime, but um, since we took a, a break, a 10 minute break about an hour ago, I was going to have us go into the last uh, presentation on the, the Zebulon district, um, and then we'll take our lunch after that. Madam Chair, um, this is David Ruffin. I unfortunately I have another Zoom um, call that I have to originate, which means I can't be on two uh, two Zooms at the same time with a California client at one o'clock Eastern, which may last about an hour. So I may miss the voting on okay. this one, but I should be on this uh, uh, for at least another. 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, so that sounds good. And um, and then you can just rejoin us after your, you said an hour's your, yes. your other call. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. So we'll be done, I, I would guess, with lunch by then. So, um, okay, great. Thank you for letting us know. Sarah. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Are you all seeing my the green Zebulon screen? Yes. All right, yes, thank excellent. you. Uh, so this is something you are very familiar with. I'm going to attempt a fairly quick summary um, of how um, Zebulon has moved, uh, the process has moved along here. The next few slides are very text heavy um, and I might not linger on them uh, long enough for you to really read while you listen at the same time, but please feel free to, to stop me or to ask questions anywhere along the way. 
Um, the Zebulon District nomination began way back, or the, the journey for it, I guess, began way back in 2016 with public meetings and with a map that looks more or less like the one you are considering today. And I'll show you a comparison of uh, where it started and where it's ended up uh, shortly. In 2017, the Wake County Historic Preservation Commission, under the leadership of the same chair and staff as today, applied for a grant to fund a survey of Zebulon. Uh, and that resulted in a study listed district supported by the Wake County Historic Preservation Commission. In 2018, the Wake County Historic Preservation Commission hired New South Associates to undertake that, that survey. Um, and at the end of the survey, the consultants presented the Zebulon Historic District to this committee for study listing with, again, with a boundary that's pretty similar to the nominated boundary. Um, and again, all these words and notes are regarding the meetings and the contacts that our office has had all along the way. Um, <clears throat> after the survey and the study listing, when property owners showed an interest in following the commission's efforts up with a National Register nomination, the town indicated that it would not be able to fund a, a nomination. So Preservation Zebulon, a local nonprofit, stepped in, and that's not unusual. We, we often have district nominations that come, uh, have been funded in a variety of different ways. Preservation Zebulon hired Firefly Preservation Consultants and um, they began their work. In the meantime, during uh, 2020, HPO staff learned from the National Park Service that we had, been, we had not been treating interlocal agreements properly in terms of how we receive comments from the certified local governments. And so we proceeded on the Park Service's advice uh, and we alerted Zebulon and the Wake County Preservation Commission that they would not be in in fact, treated as, as a CLG for commenting purposes. Um, and this was a change and we acknowledged that and, uh, and tried to let them know that. Then by the end of 2020, the nomination was ready to move along to NRAC. So you all saw it in February of 2021, uh, but the town requested that the nominations consideration be deferred and the committee, uh, the committee did that. The, the committee deferred it, but you all did uh, ask the town specifically to engage in the public outreach that they felt had been missing. Um, it, that was their, that was the town's reason for asking for the deferral was to get more public comment, more public input. So following the February 2021 meeting, HPO staff advised the town of deadlines for getting comments back to us uh, that in a way that we could incorporate into the nomination. The town missed, uh, missed deadlines for that kind of input and the commission, the Wake County Commi Preservation Commission, which had won the grant for the survey work in the first place and had um, been following along with the, the study listed district, also began voicing some opposition to the district. Comments from the public and property owners, however, remained and, and continue to remain um, overwhelmingly positive. Hmm. Um, at the June 2021 National Register Advisory Committee meeting, the committee approved the Zebulon Historic District and uh, in our office forwarded it to the National Park Service, which is the normal procedure. Um, in August of 2021, the town of Zebulon petitioned the Park Service for a substantive review of the nomination, citing four factors. Uh, they claimed that the district did not meet the criteria for National Register listing, that our office had made prejudicial errors in procedure, that our office had made errors in professional judgment, and that the town and the county are parties to an interlocal agreement. And that that interlocal agreement uh, is the way it talks about the way that the county and the town can comment on nominations as they come through. So following a substantive review, the Park Service returned the nomination and they cited pre prejudicial error uh, because the town and county were not recognized at CL as CLGs. And again, we were following the Park Service's advice on that. And um, but it, it we should have double checked our own um, 
cop, you know, our own versions of those interlocal agreements and sort of trusted ourselves to continue doing that, having that interaction and that comment in the way we had been doing it for a very long time um, and trust that we know our agreements better than the Park Service does. But um, uh, but anyway, so they they found that we had made an error by following uh, following their advice. But the Park Service did find that the nomination itself meets the criteria for listing. So in October, our office held a stakeholders meeting with the sponsor, the town, and the county. And we reviewed the Park Service's findings. Those findings meant that the nomination needed to be resubmitted if it was to move forward. So Preservation Zebulon resubmitted the nomination and our, our office began the, nom the notification process with the town and county recognized as the CLG. So we were correcting the error. The resubmitted nomination, uh, which is before you today, has not been changed from the June 2021 meeting. And I do want to note here particularly that the Park Service felt that the author's work, the consultant's work, was solid and that the nomination made a defensible case for listing the district. Um, and additionally, our staff felt that the consultant's work was very good. And I want to make it clear the nomination was not returned because of any problems with the consultant's work. So a summary of the most recent actions. The Park Service returned the nomination for procedural errors. Preservation uh, Zebulon resubmitted the unaltered nomination. The HPO corrected the procedural errors. Zebulon and the Wake County Historic Preservation Commission in their commenting as uh, CLG found that the nomination does not meet the, not the National Register criteria. The Park Service, however, had found that the nomination does meet the criteria, and now the nomination is back in your hands for recommendation. So here's the map we started with that, that our office sketched out in 2016 uh, in, in conversation with Zebulon in the county uh, before the survey work started. And then on the right-hand side of the screen is the is the district bounds you're considering today. The boundaries are different. There was refinement that occurred um, in the process and the study listed um, boundary would sort of fit in between here. And, uh, and it also was a little bit different, a little tighter and smaller than the 2016 map. Um, and then the 2021 map is also a little bit tighter and smaller as the um, nomination refined the boundary. So now we are at the standard presentation that we normally give for um, for a district. And you've seen this before, but not mm -hmm. everyone was on the committee at the time. So I'm going to uh, move through this. Zebulon is in, of course, Eastern Wake County. And uh, here's the district bounds. This encompasses an intact collection of Zebulon's historic, commercial, residential, and institutional buildings constructed following the 1906 arrival of the Raleigh and Pamlico Sound Railroad and the town's establishment shortly thereafter. The period of significance begins in 1906 with the construction of the district's earliest resources and ends in 1971 to include the town's modernist style resources specifically the 1971 Central Carolina Bank and Trust Building, and to reflect a sharp decline in the construction of mid 20th century resources as most of the lots were built out. The district is locally significant under criterion A for commerce as an important trading center for Eastern Wake County and nearby Franklin, Nash, Wilson, and Johnston counties. Zebulon's commercial core extends north from the railroad, which forms the southern boundary of the district, and is concentrated along North Arundel Avenue, Vance and Horton Streets. Zebulon's commercial area served townspeople, local farmers and travelers alike, complete with shops, hotels, restaurants, banks, and a post office. Downtown also, also offered professional services, civic activities, and entertainment. Zebulon's commercial significance continued into the mid 20th century as evidenced by the construction of approximately 14 new buildings within the commercial core between 1945 and 1971. Several buildings like the Shambly Garage and Stables, shown in the bottom two photographs, 
were first constructed earlier, but received mid-century alterations. Both of these buildings were originally constructed in 1921, but received circa 1950 facade updates. This is 14 out of approximately 38 total commercial buildings um, that, ha uh, that Hannah had done as a count um, in the district to describe the mid-century um, mid sort of impact of, uh, of downtown, in downtown. Um, the district is also significant under criterion A in the area of community planning and development as an example of a town-wide gridiron plan platted in two primary sections, the southern portion during the early 20th century and the northern in the mid 20th century. The Zebulon Land Company purchased about 100 acres adjacent to the newly constructed railroad in 1906, platting this land by 1908. The east end of the district was platted by the Raleigh Real Estate Company and, developed George, and developer George Gill, also in 1908. The town was, arra was arranged in a grid pattern, considered the most efficient and cost-effective subdivision method at that time. Commercial blocks had narrow lots suitable for storefronts and wide roads for heavier traffic, while the residential areas featured wider lots and narrower streets. <clears throat> As Zebulon's population continued to grow through the early to mid 20th century, driven in part by expanding industry in Zebulon following the Great Depression, and in part by veterans returning from World War II, the residential area expanded north toward the 1909 Wake Lawn School, which anchors the north end of the district. This area was originally surveyed and subdivided by 19, in 1907, However, it did not develop immediately and was replatted as Wake Lawn Heights in 1954. It followed the same grid pattern street layout as the earlier section. The district is locally significant under Criterion A for architecture. It includes an intact collection of vernacular and high style buildings demonstrating popular national trends during the early, mid, early to mid 20th century. Early architectural styles are concentrated in the southern section of the district and include Queen Anne, Colonial Revival, Georgian Revival, Italian Renaissance Revival, Craftsman, Period Cottage, and then vernacular houses that represent some of the earliest buildings in the historic district and typically featured pared down Queen Anne colonial revival or craftsman detailing. Commercial and industrial buildings are typically one or two story vernacular brick buildings with minimal detailing. However, there is one Italianate style building, the Citizens Drug Company. I think I've, I've got a few things out of order here. I'm sorry. I have some minimal mm -hmm. traditional houses mm -hmm. and then uh, ranch style houses, which make up about one third of the district and demonstrate three subtypes, <clears throat> the archetypal, colonial revival and contemporary. And a few modernist buildings, which brings us up to our 1971 period of significance ending. The district contains two individually listed resources, Wake Lawn School listed in 1976 under Criterion A for Education and Criterion C for Architecture. It was constructed in 1909 to serve elementary and high school students and features elements of both the Italianate and neoclassical styles. Because of its inclusion, the district has an added area of significance for education. The 1914 George and Neva Barbie House, listed in 2007 under Criterion C for Architecture, is an intact example of a craftsman style four square house. The district includes 241 contributing primary resources and 79 contributing secondary resources. Only 45 primary resources and 46 secondary resources are non contributing. There's little infill construction in the district and few substantial alterations or additions have been made to the buildings. The district is bounded on all sides by later construction, vacant lots, or buildings that have been highly altered and no longer have material integrity to convey, to convey their significance. North of the district is the highway and some new commercial construction. On the west, there is more recent, there is more recent housing development. There's a pocket of new construction uh, kind of 
here in the center of town, uh, directly, well, really kind of right there, directly above the commercial area. And then south of the district, there's a higher concentration of altered buildings and later construction, particularly along West Horton and Vance Street. Further south along Barbie Street is an area of town that was historically black, directly south of the train tracks, particularly near the intersection of Ar South Arundel and Barbie Street. Uh, there is a high concentration of non-historic construction and vacant lots. This is a 1944 Sanborn map that shows this intersection. Uh, and you can see there were small, uh, several stores and small houses. Mm -hmm. So this is a gas station. These um, are stores. You can see the S uh, for store all along here. There's a D for dwelling. So some of these are houses. It's a little combination of houses and stores. Um, <clears throat> and so, this is sort of with the modern streets kind of faded out behind it. I'm not sure that's super helpful, but then you can see today that there um, there's doesn't appear to be anything left from what was on the 1944 Sanborn map. And then this is a street level view of that same intersection. intersection. The top view is looking east down East Barbie Street, and the bottom view is looking uh, from the intersection looking west down West Barbie Street. The last remaining area of older houses, circled here in red, is disconnected from the district by vacant land and newer buildings circled, sort of circled ish in green here. To the east of the proposed district, uh, circled in red, there are no concentration of contiguous historic resources east of North Arundel Avenue due to new commercial development, vacant lots, material changes to historic residences, uh, and those residences being used for commercial purposes. So you can see here, um, just sort of by looking at the map, the way uh, the buildings are larger and more spread out, which is suggesting newer commercial uses and parking lots. Uh, and here are some photographs to help help illustrate that a little bit. The top photograph shows a circa 2000 building. Uh, the middle two pictures are vacant lots and the bottom photo is a former Rite Aid. Um, a few relatively intact houses are mixed in along the street, but generally this is the character of the east side of North Arundel, which makes it a clear cutoff uh, for the boundary. And the blue circle shows the general area of what was previously surveyed uh, as early as 1991 by our, our office as the Northeast Zebulon neighborhood. Um, this, it, the notes from that 1991 survey say that this is a traditionally black neighborhood in Northeastern Zebulon featuring modest one-story AAA and pyramidal roofed houses and bungalows among later dwellings and mobile homes. Um, also in the area circled in blue uh, is a, a good deal of non-historic construction interspersed with the historical properties, uh, which basically made it so uh, we couldn't include it um, in the existing district. And this is an, a, a closer in aerial. You can see some of these, these long buildings here and here are mobile homes. There's another yeah. one here. Yeah. Um, and there were just several instances where more recent construction is really um, interspersed. So in sum, the Zebulon Historic District retains the integrity to convey its local significance under Criterion A for commerce, community planning, community planning and development, and education, as well as Criterion C for architecture with a period of significance spanning 1906 to 1971. Um, and again, here's another look at the same. These are the maps we saw earlier. And then a couple of notes addressing things that have come up in the past, um, concerns about the district. Um, the idea of a National Register district in Zebulon has been considered since at least 2016. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, the resulting boundary is not that much, not particularly different from what's been publicized over these past years. Uh, and just to put the, the district size and period of significance in context within Wake County, um, the it, its period of significance is right in the average span for districts in Wake County. 
and the district size is large for Wake County, but it, within the state, uh, it's it's a very average um, size dif district. Um, staff recommends approval of the nomination. Thank you, Sarah. Um, questions and or comments? Uh, yeah, this is Matt Jorgensen. I'm just curious what's going on down at the south end with like some small chunk of train tracks that seems to be including in the district. Yeah, the um, the train tracks are included because of the train's history to, you know, its relationship to Zebulon. The train is, the, Zebulon's there because the train is there. Gotcha. And so related to that, it was unclear to me why that southern district that had been an African-American neighborhood could not be included if it was contiguous to train tracks that are part of the proposed district. Yep, there is a lot of space, and I've, I've stopped sharing my screen, but there is a lot of open space. Um, I think that that street view of the Barbie Street, Arundel Avenue intersection kind of helped bring that home, that there's this loss of contiguous material, contiguous buildings to help pull it all together. Yeah, I remember that being discussed uh, before about the continuity was that issue. Have they submitted a grant to do additional work to see if there is a district in that area for African American resources? We have not received a grant application, but they're not, they wouldn't be, we wouldn't have yet. Okay, okay. <laughs> to, to, to help answer Sarah's question, our CLG grant uh, cycle just opened up and is still gonna be open through mid-April, so. It's it's still in process. Anything that anyone want to come to us, it's we're we just opened it up. So, uh, Sarah, that uh, area, uh, well, Zebulon is uh, about uh, fifty three percent white and thirty nine to forty percent African American. Correct. Uh, I was in that area about a week ago to the Whitley Furniture. I visited the Whitley uh, Furniture Store, and I think one of one of their houses, one of the houses owned by the Whitley family, is included in this. But uh, what precisely is the uh, 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 African American makeup uh, of this historic district? Um, I do not know. I suspect it's it is a majority white um, district, but I don't know that. Um, one of the so one of the one of the things that happens when we have a district is um, someone has come to us with the idea for listing a district, and mm -hmm. usually, generally speaking a community's first district will be their downtown. That's usually where the focus is um, for just for the district and for thinking about the town's history. Most people think about downtown. Um, and so then the process is to sort of go from there and see what else is contiguous to downtown. And we have lots of neighborhoods that end up being cut off by development or open lots or a big highway. Um, that's why instead of, um, you know, if you look at Raleigh, Raleigh has a, a zillion little, um, or not little, but smaller national register districts whether, re, instead of one gigantic district. Um, mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that's sort of reflecting, it's reflecting a couple of things, but ultimately just sort of generically reflecting the development of Raleigh. So on a smaller scale, the same thing happens in other communities, different parts of the town develop differently, or there's something that happens that cuts off sections of town. So we find a boundary and the sponsor of the nomination really wants to stay focused on downtown. And we mm -hmm. don't really get a say in, well, we'd rather see you list this other part of town. Um, you know, we have to go, we, we sort of, we're sort of given what 
we work we work with what someone comes to us with um oh. and most of the time that's a focus on downtown right so in light of our discussion about uh, infield mm -hmm. uh, do you think it's it, it may be possible in the future to tinker with this process a little so that we do not necessarily allow ourselves uh, to be guided exclusively by the wishes of the folk who come to us without us in turn asking them about their involvement in the total community process or the extent or asking them to extent the extent to which they have actually uh, uh, tried to involve the voices of, of other components of the community in the process. Because now it appears that a track has been developed and, uh, and, and, and the folk who submit, you know, these proposals say, well, we've gotten together this is what we want to do and they bring it to us and we simply say well this looks good and all of that let's go with it so there's there's more much what we do well there's more editing that happens in there more refinement of the district but at the same time uh if if a sponsor if we said to a sponsor uh well the district needs to be x amount bigger um then then it's up the sponsor has to figure out how to navigate that and if they can um sort of what they're going to do with that information and so sometimes we we end up not having districts sometimes we say to someone who wants to to list we say well um we don't really think this piece and often it's maybe a single building is eligible by itself, but it would be eligible within this greater context. And they don't have the money or the interest or the energy or whatever to do the larger district. Um, so it's not always just what someone wants we move forward with, but there there are there are constraints as to what um, what a sponsor is going to work on. Um, I do think, and and I don't, I I, I don't want to get into it because I don't want to um, get involved in speculation or future um, nominations. But I think we may see a district nomination coming through eventually that is a discontiguous district that uses the idea of doing a discontiguous district to jump, so to speak, over development that normally we probably wouldn't have jumped over we would have just said the district ends here and if you want another district you can do that but instead this consultant is going to try to link to um separate areas of a community into one nomination but with a discontiguous boundary so we'll kind of see how that's a little bit um we'll see how that works we'll see if that's what ends up coming before you but um I think we are trying to be more creative and think more creatively and push our consultants and push the sponsors to um, to to basically to do what Secretary Wilson mentioned, um, I think, or maybe it was Dr. Waters, um, that we are trying to be more inclusive and tell a full or more complete story. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jorgensen. Um, I just wanted to clarify and, and in, in response to Dr. Denard's question, but also um, it, it sounds like you're talking about the process and it, it is, am I right in thinking that our job in this committee is to approve or deny what we're presented with? Our job is not to be involved in the process. So whether it's good or bad is, is immaterial because being involved in that process is not our job, correct? Uh... Dr. Johnson, I know you. <laughs> well, it's kind of yeah. tricky because several of us have different, several responsibilities that kind of help us bring this all together. So I was going to say that um, Sarah and uh, Ramona have been working with Angela um, with the African American Heritage Commission 
to craft, to create, think about how to better get information out to communities or to, to persons um, who, are, who would be, who wouldn't necessarily think that this is a priority thing that I wanna do. And so in that way, um, I'm also involved with that particular process. So some of that deliberation does um, come into how I understand what we're doing here with this work. So I don't see it that cut and dried. I think that we are to um, trust the process, but our questions are helping us understand maybe areas where the process can be refined or thinking of things that might not have been thought of to go forward in a different iteration. So we are a little bit advisory in that sense, as I understand it. And, and certainly the decisions that we make set precedent, right? And so they influence future process. And I mean, I, uh, of course, we are bound by the decisions that the NPS makes, right? But, um, but we can make decisions and recommendations that they can send back to us too, right? As, as happened here. But, you know, um, I saw that, that Sean had his hand up at one point. Yes, thank you. I, I, because I'm late or late to this particular nomination, obviously, I read through the correspondence, which was very interesting. So I, I do have a question just from my own knowledge. What is the source of the town and the Wake County Historic Preservation Commission's opposition? Is it that they don't want a district at all, or is it just the boundaries and, and how it's defined? I don't have an honest answer to that que <laughs> to that question. Um, I have the inf I have the same information you have. That is about as um, expansive as the town or the county have been in sharing our sharing their concerns mm -hmm. with us. There, there is a, a question from the, uh, in the YouTube um, from Zebulon Planning. It is related to, to tax credits. And I, I know that we cannot make decisions based on um, tax credit considerations, but I, I wanna acknowledge that the question is there. And I don't know, um, Sarah, if you want to. Dr. Hill, I'm, I'm glad to, to jump in on that yeah, one as well. That would be great, thank you. Sure. Um, the, the question that relates, as I understand it, to what about buildings, which we saw similar buildings in Pilot Mountain, as you might recall, in a, uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, that particular presentation. Um, the, the question of buildings that have several iterations, shall we say, facades and so forth, is a nuanced question that our tax credit uh, staff, our restoration staff deals with frequently. So we'd be glad to uh, work with any constituent who has these issues. But yes, Dr. McGill as chair, you are correct. This, this body does not get into questions of whether something uh, comes to us as a nomination, whether or not it is being um, moved forward for uh, to use historic tax credits. Right, thank, thank you. Um, I, I have a, a tech question for Matt. Um, do people in the YouTube stream see the um, chat room? Okay, then I'm gonna at least read the, the question that um, was posed. So um, it said, uh, would the 1960s modifications that would be contributing resources for downtown buildings be eligible for tax credits to restore the buildings to an earlier date? So I just wanted that on the on the record that the, that was the question. And then there's also a, a comment here um, that the town is in support of a district. This is from Zebulon Planning. The town is in support of a district, but to follow a fully inclusive process in a district that represents the historic history. I'm assuming this is the history of Zebulon. Oh, thank you, Ramona. Yeah. Ramona reminded me that this is not a public hearing, but we're we're including these comments as a courtesy. Other questions, comments, motions? 
I make a motion to approve the nomination for listing. Is there a second? Valerie Ann Johnson, I second. All right, we will move into our vote then. So the, the motion was to approve the um, proposal and our options, I, I wanna um, make sure I'm correct here, are to vote yes, no, or abstain. Is that correct? Okay. Um, all right. Um, I, so I'm the first on my screen, Alicia McGill, and I'm gonna abstain from this vote. Um, Dr. Bryan. You're muted. Yes. Yes. Josie Ward. You're muted. Apologies. I'm going to abstain having missed so many of the previous discussions and presentations as a new committee member. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Brothers. Yes. Thank you. Fred Belladin. Yes. Uh, Mr. Bergstone. I made the motion. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. I'm, I, so then Mr. Jorgensen, we have not had, thank you. So Mr. Jorgensen. Yes. I vote thank yes. you. Dr. Denard. I vote yes. Thank you. Mr. Patch. Yes. Okay, thank you. That's, that is all of us. All right. Yes. Madam Chair, just for the record, I had two abstentions and eight affirmatives. Thank you. Uh, all right. I think we should all take lunch now, <laughs> um, and then we'll come back and do um, all of the study list presentations. Um, it is 1.15. And I'm going to have us uh, take a 45 minute lunch um, and come back at two o'clock. Um, and sorry, I'm seeing that Matt um, put a, a comment here um, that the Zoom chat isn't sent to the, the YouTube because it's, it's not possible to deal with all of the details of that. Um, okay. So uh, if you can stay on, please do so. I will actually have to sign off and sign back on. But um, And if you do stay on, please mute yourself and turn off your video. And we will see everyone um, back here at 2 o'clock. All right. Thanks.
when when <clears throat> we think we have everyone back. <laughs> yeah, we have we have our quorum. Dr. Okay. Johnson had messaged me and said that she'll be with us momentarily. Um, and then I know that um, Mr. Ruffin will be rejoining us as well. Okay. But, so I'll just wait another minute or so. Okay. If you want to pull up your presentation though. Yeah. And you just have the one. Um, let's see. I have one for now. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. And then and then Jeff. And then then you have two. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. I'm gonna call our meeting back to order. This is the second half of the February 2022 North Carolina National Register Advisory Committee meeting, and we'll be hearing presentations for um, study list considerations um, this afternoon. And um, Matt, if you have not already had us go live again, we're ready to do so. All right, great. Thank you. Well, welcome back, everybody. I hope that everybody had a lunch or took care of email or whatever you needed to do. Um, and uh, we have um, Sarah Woodard will give us the um, first study list presentation for the afternoon. So um, we will uh, proceed as we did in the morning where um, after each set of um, presentations, we'll take a um, by each individual um, person will have discussion and take our vote unless um, anyone and any of our presenters anticipate there being significant discussion or concern about specific properties. Um, and we will vote on this, the whole group unless we have any staff or any committee members step out for any reason. So, uh, all right, Sarah. Okay, great. And y'all are seeing my screen with the Holder House. Yes. Awesome. All right, so this is the Holder House in Watauga County. Um, Watauga County, of course, is up in the northwest corner of the state. And the house is, uh, its address says Boone, but it's really pretty close to Blowing Rock. Um, Ethel May Hampton Holder was born in 1901 and was one of the first women to graduate from what became Appalachian State University. Ethel taught school and purportedly she was the first woman to cast a vote in Watauga County. In 1928, she married a man named Boyce Holder, who was a carpenter, and the couple moved into a small house at this location. In the depths of the depression, they moved into a room attached to an old school and tore down the small house. Boyce continued his job as a carpenter while Ethel ran the family's farm. On top of their regular tasks, Boyce and the couple's sons built this house reusing much of the older house. Interior paneling was a splurge in the 1930s, but the older house's beaded boards used for the ceilings have been covered with plaster, as you can see. Mm -hmm. A stone fireplace is located in the living room. It's not a great picture, but it has a um, giant stone lintel piece. Um, and the house underwent modest expansions in the 1940s to accommodate the family of 10 uh, pictured here. Vinyl siding and other changes have diminished the house's architectural integrity, and while the Holder's family history does include Ethel's support of education and women's, uh, women's suffrage, the history associated with the house does not rise to the level of significance necessary for a National Register listing. The staff does not recommend study listing the house, but we do appreciate Janet Greer's commitment to her family's history, and we will create a survey file for this property. So that's the Holder House, if you want to vote on it or if you want me to hand it off to Jeff. No, I think we'll, I'll think we'll vote on it because in the past we always go by the individual presenter. So, OK, great. Um, are, are there any comments or questions? No. Nope. All right. Is there a motion to um, uh, approve staff's recommendations to not study list the Holder House. So move. 
Thank you, Dr. Bryan. Is there a second? I will second Matt Jorgensen. Thank you. Um, and I'm just going to go through my screen here. Uh, Alicia McGill, I vote um, to approve staff recommendations. Um, Sean Patch. Yes, I approve staff recommendations. Thank you. Fred Bell Belladin. Yes, I agree with staff. Thank you. David Bergstone. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Denard. I agree with staff recommendation. Josie Ward. Oh, you're, you're muted. Sorry, my space bar isn't working all of a sudden. I concur with staff. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ruffin. Um, I defer because I had not heard. The oh, okay. I, I just I joined, sure I just joined the conversation. Thank, yeah. thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, Dr. Brothers. Yes. Okay. I, I think I got everyone. People have moved around on my screen. So, oh, Dr. Johnson, I'm sorry. Yeah, people have moved. I, I've been here the whole, the whole time, so I can cover with staff recommendations. Thank you. All right. Um, so then we have one abstention um, and the rest approval for staff re recommendations. Um, and we'll move on to Jeff Smith's presentation on the Claremont Elementary School. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, thanks. Hopefully it's the right one. I have about 11,000 screens open, so bear with me. That's not right. Here we go. Can everyone see that? The, the presentation? We are seeing HPA web map. I think I'm not sure we're seeing a presentation. I'm sorry, everyone. Let me stop sharing and close a few windows. I was trying to be overly productive. I think it's because I have so many scrap three screens here. That's what I'm working against. I want to make my PowerPoint a primary screen. How about now? Not yet. No. <clears throat> what are you seeing now? <laughs> Nothing. Not Just the regular. Um, really? Group of folks. I'm not creating a great first impression. When you click on share screen, it should give you some choices of which screen to share. Oh, there you go. Here we go. It's there. All right. Okay. I apologize for that delay. Um, so um, this is the Claremont School, which kind of like Sarah's property, um, it has an address of uh, Burnsville, but it's actually um, in the Burnsville vicinity, about 10 miles to the north uh, in Yancey, Yancey County, North Carolina, so out in the west. I did not get the memo <laughs> with the, uh, about the slide with the big red star, so um, <laughs> anyway, this is kind of a general, let me get this in presentation mode. So that should give you a general idea of where the community is located. Jeff, you need to swap screens at the top of your screen. It should, if you hover at the very top of your screen, it'll give you an option to swap screens because we're seeing your notes screen. Okay. Yes. You see display settings right above your map? Yeah, I do. It's just that the mouse will not. There we go. Come on, man. I just can't get the mouse over to my laptop to get to that, that particular 
um, option under the display settings. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I guess he can go. Hey, I can see the, the slide. I mean, granted, the next yeah. slide up is showing, but I have no problem seeing what he's trying to show us. Yeah, yeah. So just carry on like you have it. Okay. Sorry. I'm sorry about that. Um, but um, uh, the Claremont School is located in rural north central Yancey County, North Carolina. Claremont is a traditional farming community isolated from the rest of the county by two mountain ranges, Jacks Creek and Toe River. Situated on a seven acre parcel, the school building is located on Claremont School Road in the vicinity of Burnsville, North Carolina. Located just south of Jacks Creek, the school building is sited at the junction of Claremont School Road and Jacks Creek Road. Construction began, let's see if I can advance some of these slides at least. Construction began on the school building in 1936 by the Civilian Conservation Corps. The one-story masonry building is capped by an asphalt shingle-clad hipped roof, and the facade spans multiple bays. Conceived by the Works Progress Administration, the school building's overall design incorporated the use of native bluestone at the Claremont School and three other neighborhood schools that were built in neighboring communities. Three front gable projections concealed behind stone gable parapets are evenly spaced along the facade. The central projection houses the recessed entrance, which is comprised of two pairs of metal double leaf doors, which are modern replacements. Um, two projections off of the rear elevation. Jeff, I'm yes. not seeing your slides advance. Is everyone else seeing them? No, I'm sorry, Dr. McGill. I'm unable to get to the next slide. So. Uh, can, you, can you use like the mouse pad on your laptop physically? Oh, there we go. How about that? Yes. Uh, okay, somehow the mouse just appeared on the laptop. <laughs> He's cranky. Um, so I'm going to backtrack just a wee bit. Um, these are some locational slides. Here's the creek. Here's the junction of the two roads. Um, here's another view, basically showing an aerial shot. Uh, so, you know, lots of uh, surrounded by mountains and uh, just very pastoral pockets. And voila, there's the school uh, facing south. And there's the facade, obviously, and you can see the hip roof. And then there's a stone retaining wall that is kind of, uh, that's, I guess, um, kind of built into Jack's Creek. Here's an overall shot of the campus. Um, primarily, the, only the school is being nominated, even though there are uh, other non there are, no, sorry, one, two, three, four non contributing buildings and one contributing structure inside of the proposed um, National Register boundary. Here's a close up of the facade uh, and the entry bay. And there's the full facade. So it's a, it's a very long facade. I think, I don't know, maybe 17 bays. Okay, I think I'm caught up photograph wise, so I'll go back to my text. Um, here we go. Two projections off of the rear elevation, which are these two, uh, the images that you're seeing now, house classrooms, while a third projection situated in between the two outer rear projections houses the school's gymnasium. And it's kind of tricky to really see it, but I've kind of, kind of got arrows pointing to it. So it's kind of flanked by those two outer uh, rear projections. Uh, the Claremont School opened in 1937 and offered instruction to white students for grades one through 12 until 1959. At that time, a new high school, East Yancey, uh, was constructed and offered instruction to the community's older students. Claremont now offered an education from kindergarten up to, up to the eighth grade. One year later in 1960, Yancey County became the first county in the state to integrate its public schools, a pivotal moment in the North Carolina educational system. Subsequent building campaigns occurred throughout the county during the 1970s, resulting in the transfer of middle school age children, so basically sixth through eighth grades, uh, to these newly constructed schools. 
As a result, Claremont offered an elementary school curriculum until it eventually closed in 2018. So I have a fairly verbose and robust um, recommendation, so bear with me. Uh, staff recommends the Claremont School for placement on the North Carolina study list. Staff also recommends the Claremont School potentially eligible for inclusion in the National Register at the local levels of significance under Criterion A for education and at the state level of significance under the area of ethnic heritage. The Claremont School is also recommended potentially eligible for the National Register at the local level of significance under Criterion C for possessing high artistic value and aesthetics using native bluestone in its construction in accordance with the WPA design. Despite the loss of some of its historic fabric, like the original windows and entrance doors, as well as the installation of interior carpeting and uh, drop ceiling tiles, the building overall retains a sufficient degree of integrity to convey its significance. And again, my um, sincere apologies for all the technical glitches. I'm happy to have, answer any questions. Thank you, Jeff. Um, could you Certainly. close your presentation <clears throat> for the discussion component? Are there any questions or comments or motions? A question for clarification, not that it will change my vote on this one, but um, if we vote to approve, are we approving listing on study list and the criteria suggestions or simply the study list recommendation? This simply ahead. study list. Yeah. So it's not necessarily also an approval of all of the recommendations for criteria. Correct. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Josie. Any other comments, questions, or motions? Dr. Denard, are you? Oh, yes, I, I'm. I'm. I'm unmuted now. I wanted to ask a question. Uh, who, who submitted this uh, uh, request for consideration? Um, a gentleman associated with the Yancey County Schools uh, submitted, were prepared and submitted uh, the application on behalf of the school system. So they are in favor of the study list application. They would like okay. to see the building, um, you know, reused in some capacity. Okay. So this is not uh, this is not private. This is public uh, uh, property, public yes, school sir. system it, property. It is, it is it is still publicly owned. Yes. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. This is Matt Jorgensen. I will move to accept staff recommendation on the Claremont Elementary School. Thank you, Matt. Is there a second? David, I second. Uh, oh. David Bergstone seconds. Thank you. All right, we will move into our vote um, to approve staff recommendations to study list the Claremont School. Uh, Dr. Bryan, you're muted. Oh, you unmuted and then remuted. <laughs> yes. Thank what you. Staff recommendation. Thank you. Alicia McGill, I vote yes. Fred Belladin. Yes. Thank you. Dr. David Denard. I vote yes. Thank you. Josie Ward. Yes. Thank you. Sean Patch. Yes. Dr. Valerie Johnson. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Tam Tamara Brothers. Yes. Um, and Mr. David Ruffin, you were here for that. Yes, whole yes, yes, I did. I was attentive. Thank you. Yes, I vote yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, we will now move on to um, another set of presentations from Sarah um, for the central and southeastern regions. And there's there's two presentations, so we'll hear Sarah's presentations, have discussion and comment, and vote, and then move before moving on to to Beth's. Okay, um, are you all seeing my Hopedale Cotton Mill? Great. Okay, the Hopedale, the Hopedale Cotton Mill is located along the Hall River in Alamance County, right here, practically in the middle of the state. 
And then here's the general vicinity. Um, this is the Hall River highlighted. And then Hopedale Cotton Mill is down here on the peninsula between Stony Creek, which is coming in from the north, and then um, uh, the Hall River. And as you can see, the Hall River is home to many, many textile mills. And just in this pretty tight uh, view, we have, um, we have three lined up right there along the Hall mm -hmm. River. The Hopedale, the Hopedale complex is vast. Um, the village is not being considered, but you can use it to get a sense of the scale of the site. The village is mm -hmm. highlighted um, up in the corner in yellow. A cotton mill was established here in the 1830s, but the oldest building here today dates to 1887. When the site was set up, when the site was up for sale uh, under the name Big Falls Mill in the late 1800s, the property description noted the 1887 mill, a grist mill, a sawmill, a storehouse, and 37 houses in the adjacent village. The 1904 Sanborn map gives you a little idea of the earlier complex. So this is the 1887 mill. And then across the mill race is the grist mill, which is gone now. And then there's the, the mill race connecting Hall River to Stony Creek. Mm -hmm. And then a bridge and two water wheels to power uh, the grist mill and the, um, the textile mill. Mm -hmm. So I think I think the race would have crossed somewhere around where I um, put that orange um, rectangle, and you can see the outline of the 1887 mill in blue. And the orange square there uh, is the one-story section that you could see on that um, 1904 Sanborn map, which housed, um, I believe, it housed an opening room, a picker room, and um, a powerhouse where power was transferred from the water wheel. Um, this wing has either been demolished or entirely encapsulated by later additions. Like most textile mills, Hopedale underwent numerous transfers in ownership, periods of closure and modernizations, and all of that resulted in many architectural changes. But the purchase of the complex by Copeland Fabrics in the 1940s was transformative, and almost all of the complex's components that are visible from the exterior date to the Copeland era. In 1949, Copeland added an office building, uh, I've highlighted that in green. It's sort of buried inside it is a, a, 19, a 1919 brick building associated with the sort of earlier um, complex. And then in 1946, 1951, and 1953, Copeland added um, a finishing plant. It's unclear from the application exactly which portions were added when, but it's this area down here was sort of added over over this period of years in the early 50s. There's a small power building that dates from 1966. And the 1887 mill is surrounded by mid 20th century additions. The application states that the additions to the northwest, so right, right along in here, um, are from Copeland's early ownership, but the rest of those additions aren't, aren't clearly dated. So then you move north across Carolina Mill Road, and there uh, we have a collection of buildings and structures from 1946 and 1947 highlighted in green. The one closest to Carolina Mill Road is a medical building. The other structures are water related, a group of three water towers, a water treatment plant, and a dam. And then this really large building is known as the Western Building or the Western Plant, and it dates to 1950. Until Copeland purchased the complex, Hopedale open, operated as a cotton mill, but Copeland invested heavily in the plant and moved its production to Rayon. And you heard about Rayon with the Black Ox plant earlier today. Copeland operated here until, uh, until 2018, and we'll go uh, through the exterior a little bit. It's a, it's a, it's a complicated site to present. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. So here we're facing south from uh, Carolina Mill Road toward the 1880s, toward the north end of the 1887 mill. And you can see the original tower sort of peeking out. 
and that's about all you can see of the 1887 mill. Um, so there's the original tower and then you can see lots of um, mid 20th century brick. And this is back out toward Carolina Mill Road, but looking down the opposite side um, along Stony Creek. Inside you can see uh, what I believe is original flooring to the 1887 mill. And uh, here's just another look inside the earlier sections of the mill. Um, and it appears that the manufacturing floor remains open, and that's a key component of architectural integrity that our office looks for in a factory. So moving back outside, um, we can see an addition uh, to the 1887 mill on the left. And then the 1946 to 53 finishing plant is to the right and straight ahead. Um, the building to the right looks like an earlier warehouse to me, but the application's physical description and site plan aren't extremely explicit and any future nomination would need to clearly map the complex's evolution and pin down the dates for these buildings. Um, another look at the finishing plant with Stony Creek to the left and then inside the finishing plant. The 1947 office building, that's the one that has a, an older building buried inside of it. And then inside of the offices. And then moving across the road, the medical building and the water towers behind it. The 1946 water treatment plant. And then looking along either side of the 1950 Western building. Staff recommends study listing of the Hopedale Cotton Mill under Criterion A in the area of in industry. The application proposes a period of significance starting with the 1887 mill, but staff feels that the period of significance will begin with Copeland's ownership and focus on the complex's history as a rayon factory but it's not necessary to hash out the period of significance at this point and uh, staff recommends approval. Sarah, do you wanna <clears throat> give your second presentation as well? Oh yes, right, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> forgot that that is- I kind of forgot too, and then I had the double, I was, yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay, and are you seeing the Warrington Community Center? Yes, but we're seeing it in your... Okay, that's what I thought, let's see. Channel, there we go. Okay, is that the full picture, the full presentation? Not yet. Nope, still not, okay. Okay, now back at it. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Uh, so this is the Warrington Community Center. Um, I did a survey of Warrington um, a few years ago when I first uh, joined the state. And so I was really excited to see this come forward. Um, the Warrington Community Center is located at the heart of Warrington's Black Commercial Center. There we go. Uh, and Warrington, uh, of course, is located just a little bit north of Raleigh up on the Virginia line. Here we are in Warrington and then zooming in to the community center building there along Franklin Street. So I'll begin our tour by quoting directly from the application. Quote, the Warrington Community Center was born out of need. In the 1930s, in, a, in the small rural county of Warren, separate was not equal. Schools lacked books and supplies, black people could not use the library, and in downtown Warrington, there were no restrooms for, quote, colored people. The community center came into being, it came into being to right a wrong and injustice against African Americans, end quote. Lenny Williams, who was a longtime school teacher and highly regarded school teacher, spearheaded the effort. Uh, 
she formed a group that incorporated and in the articles of incorporation uh, they stated that the community center would be built for the purpose of stimulating and developing the educational life of the negro citizens and to provide therein facilities for their comfort and convenience the group purchased land and money came from the works progress administration state and local governments and local citizens residents made bricks and provided the labor for construction the new building provided restrooms and showers, a game room, library, lounge, and space for gatherings and meetings. The center has hosted its share of luminaries from Floyd McKissick to Langston Hughes. The Tony nominated and Emmy, Emmy winning actor Earl Hyming credits his borrowing of a book of Shakespeare's plays from the center's library with changing his life. And you may remember him as Russell Huxtable, uh, who was Cliff Huxtable's father on The Cosby Show. Uh, he, he is a much lauded actor for many other reasons, but that's what I remember him for. <laughs> um, the center remains in use as a community center with various programs serving in the same role for over 80 years. Uh, who knows what future star or leader is participating in the center's programs right now? So now for a tour, the building retains very good integrity. On the facade, I've sort of highlighted in green here, uh, a few, few alterations. Um, several basement windows have been replaced because of some flooding that happened a few years ago. And uh, one set of French doors has been replaced. The concrete steps were covered in brick. I'm not exactly sure when, um, but the, the group uh, it's still, it is still a nonprofit community center and the group is planning to take up the brick and restore the concrete. Um, coming around the um, west side of the building um, and around toward the back. Again, a few changes. <clears throat> um, these were made again because of some water problems. Uh, one door bricked up and then uh, three windows changed out. And now we're just moving around the other side. Again, some changes to the basement level windows. And we're back to the front and the cornerstone. Uh, community center built by WPA and citizens, 1936. Um, inside, this is the main room. So you can see original floors and plaster, uh, beadboard ceilings. You'll notice it's exposed electrical conduit throughout the whole building. Um, all the interior walls are solid brick. Um, this building is not going anywhere. Just another view of that main gathering room. Um, the brick on this mantelpiece appears to be a modification. It might date to the 1950s. That's when the group undertook a fundraising campaign to make some, some updates. This is looking the other way in the community room. We're facing down toward the library um, at that behind those um, two sets of French doors. Uh, the main room opens up onto a porch with a concrete floor. And then this is in the library. Um, the library still has books from the original collection from the 30s. And again, they're still, they have an after school uh, enrichment program here. Um, they have a lot, they have a lot of programming um, still happening here. Lots of original hardware, um, early Venetian blondes, maybe original Venetian blondes on the doors, I'm not sure. <clears throat> and then this is at the opposite end of the building, um, uh, opposite from the library, the, the, the other end of the long community room. This is the ladies lounge. The kitchen has modern appliances in it, um, but we do have at least one sink in one of the bathrooms. And then uh, there's a stairwell that leads down to the basement. And the basement retains some ceiling mounted radiators. Um, and it's just again, divided up into space for different community uses. So uh, staff heartily recommends study listing the Warrington Community Center, and uh, it would be eligible under Criterion A for social history and Black ethnic heritage. Great, thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> Do you want to, yeah, thanks. Questions, 
comments or motions? Um, Dr. Johnson here. I do have a comment. I, I too, thank you so much, Sarah, because I've been waiting for this um, to come before us in, in the sense that it, I've toured the facility and um, the y'all have, the office has really, really worked with the community to help get this before us. And so I think that this is, an, this is kind of evidence of what we talked about a little bit earlier of helping communities that might not otherwise, even though they had the will, they just need to know some of the ways to navigate um, that register nomination form. But um, they were very committed to this particular endeavor. And right next in the photo, um, to the wet, right to the west is the old radio station um, that was in. It was a part of the um, really the civil rights movement, and um, it sort of helps to inter. It helps as part of the interpretation of that area, because then on the other side of that is the historic African American church. So the the Episcopal Church uh, is working on a nomination for the church building, the um, the commercial building where the radio station was, um, because of that radio station is extremely important. Um, unfortunately, the roof has collapsed in there pretty recently. Oh. And it's, collap it's collapsed all the way through to the bottom. I mean, like all the way through. Um, it's heartbreaking. Um, I, I have on my work plan, and one day I really will get to it, to do an application for a highway marker for the radio station. I think it would be a good highway marker candidate. So, mm -hmm. But yeah, there's, it's a really um, a tight little pocket of really important buildings there. But that what you're saying speaks also to the importance of these buildings being listed and attention being placed because when I was there just I think two two years ago mm -hmm. that commercial building was intact and they were talking about what to do because it also was um medical offices yes. were there and so it was an important place yes. for the Warrington community black community yeah Sarah I just wanted to note if you needed help with the um the marker, it might be a great um, class project for, for college students. I know of a professor down at Fable State that's done that um, oh, as a part yeah. of her curriculum, so. That's a good, that would be fantastic. <laughs> any, any, any of y'all in the academic field, um, <laughs> I, would, I would love to pass along some information and, let, and get <laughs> someone to do that. I'll send you an email afterwards. <laughs> fantastic. Thank you for those additions and the additional um, contextual information too. Any other comments or questions or motions? I'll make a I, I, Mr. Bergstone, was that you? Yes. And you said motion to approve. Um, both of the properties have been presented. Thanks. Great. Is there a second? I'll second. Oh. Thank, thank you, Dr. Johnson. All right. We'll move into our vote. Uh, Dr. Bryan. Yes. Alicia McGill. Yes. Fred Belladin. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Denard. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ward. Yes to both. Thank you. Dr. Brothers. Yes to both. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jorgensen. Yes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Patch? Yes. Thank you. And Mr. Ruffin? Yes. Thank you. Great. Now we will move on to um, Beth's presentations. Oh, there's a question from um, David Bergstone about whether or not there are any viewers still on YouTube. That, that would be a question for you. Matt may have stepped away, but yeah. I will see if I can track down that answer. Yeah, I mean, it arrived as a I see 16. I have it up. Oh, oh okay. Thank you, Julie. Sure. 16. 
Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> all right. Um, can you all see? Let me get you to the right slide. Yes. Come on. There we go. All right. So, Dr. Michael, I have two properties to present today, but I do think it might be easier if we discuss them individually. So Fine. we'll do. Um, we'll do Winston-Salem Lake Golf Course first. Great. Thank and you. this application, uh, this is for a city-owned property in Winston-Salem, and um, the city submitted, or they hired a consultant to submit this application. And um, when I conclude my presentation, I'll have a few comments to share from the city council member who represents the East Ward in Winston-Salem. Great. Thank you. Uh-huh. So the Winston-Salem Lake Golf Course is a component of city-owned Winston Lake Park in Winston-Salem. The 221-acre course was completed in two phases. The first nine holes, designed by F. Elwood Allen, opened in 1956, and the second nine holes, designed by Ellis Maples, were completed in 1964. When Winston Lake opened, recreational activities in North Carolina remained strictly segregated by race. Prior to Winston Lake, African-American golfers in Forsyth County worked as, ca worked as caddies at city-owned Reynolds Park Golf Course or at numerous private courses so that they could play on Mondays, uh, which was the day when golf courses were officially closed for maintenance. For context, municipal golf courses began to desegregate during the 1950s as a result of federal court judgments. Uh, Houston's came in 1950, Louisville in 1952, and Charlotte in 1956. In addition, the Supreme Court required Atlanta to integrate its municipal courses in 1955. In North Carolina, NOCO Park in Greensboro was opened for Black golfers only in 1950. However, the city closed the course in 1956 in order to expand its sewage treatment plant. This decision came on the heels of a late 1955 court order integrating nearby Gillespie Park golf course. Within two weeks of this course order, court order, the Gillespie uh, clubhouse mysteriously burned to the ground and the city condemned the golf course. So in the same year that Greensboro closed both of its municipal golf courses, Winston Lake Golf Course opened as an integrated municipal course. However, because Winston-Salem's other municipal golf course, Reynolds Park, remained segregated until 1962, Winston Lake was the de facto black golf course. The United Golfers Association, which sponsored tournaments for black golfers nationwide, hosted tournaments at Winston Lake in the late 1950s and 1960s. The Winston Lake Golfers Association challenged discrimination at whites only courses and tournaments during the 1960s. In 1962, the association protested the annual municipally funded Publix tournament held at Reynolds Park and other private courses. The event was canceled and the city of Winston-Salem fired Winston Lakes golf professional, Harold Dunavant, who's seen here in 1960 on the course. But the city desegregated Reynolds Park a few months later. The Winston Lake Golfers Association was instrumental in securing funding to expand the original nine holes to 18 in 1964, stimulating corporate support from RJ Reynolds, Haynes, and Wachovia Bank and Trust um, through interactions of um, of locally prominent African-American leaders who, who reached out to those corporations. Even after court rulings mandated that public recreation facilities must be open to all races, Winston Lake provided an inclusive atmosphere for a sport that has a high barrier to entry. E. Jerry Jones, a highly respected golf professional, managed the course between 1962 and 1984. Mr. Jones created an integrated junior golf program reduced screens fees for seniors and students, and established the Winston Lake Amateur Professional Open Golf Tournament in 1965, which provided a more welcoming alternative to the PGA Tour, which had banned golf, black golfers as late as the 1960 season. Here are um, 
<clears throat> here are aerial views of the course from 2018, uh, 1984, and 1958. The 1958 aerial is showing you only the original nine holes. Um, we're primarily discussing study list potential for the golf course itself and a handful of features, which include four wooden bridges like the one seen here. These were constructed in 1956. And then there's also a, a small chemical storage building from the 1960s. The larger buildings at Winston Lake are a relatively recent construction, and they include the 2001 Clubhouse, the 2018 Comfort Station, the 2016 Learning Center, and a 1989 maintenance building. So if a nomination is forthcoming, um, all of these buildings would be non-contributing due to their age. Uh, in this slide, you get a sense of how most of the new construction at Winston Lake Golf Course is grouped along Winston Lake Road. And here you can see Winston Lake Road in, in relation to the greens. Um, and you can see that a lot of this construction, this, this newer addition, newer construction to the golf course is here on the southwest side of the property. Uh, staff recommends adding Winston Lake Golf Course to the study list as potentially eligible under Criterion A for Black Ethnic Heritage and Recreation or potentially Black Ethnic Heritage and Social History. And uh, we anticipate the period of significance would begin when the course opened in 1956 and would most likely end around the 50 year mark at, at which time the, the nomination is forthcoming. Um, and as I mentioned, I have some comments that I received yesterday from Annette Scipio, um, council member for the East Ward. And I'll just read directly from these comments. Uh, the Winston Lake Golf Course within Winston Lake Park has survived the test of time and is continuing to be a landmark of the progressive nature of our city fathers during segregation. Few mm -hmm. municipalities built golf courses and parks for their African-American citizens. Those that did chose undesirable land and locations. Today, golfers consider Winston Lake Golf Course one of the most challenging. Its natural woodsy setting among its gentle slopes and hills provide a real workout. Over the years, the course has been a critical location where African-Americans discuss civil rights, voting rights, civic issues, and concerns. It has been a site where African-Americans could enjoy the freedom and liberation that golfing brings. Thank you for that, Beth. Um, questions, comments, or motion? I have to admit, it is a challenging course, <laughs> but I recommend approval. So is that a motion? Yes. OK, great. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. I'll second. Um, I think Dr. Brothers got it in there first, so. Okay. Uh, well, I know Dr. Denar has been trying to second for a while, so you can. Okay, all right, it. all right. Well, then we'll, for, for the record, we'll, we'll have um, Dr. Denar there. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to our, our vote. Um, Dr. Bryan. Yes. Thank you. Alicia McGill, yes. Uh, Fred Belladin. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Josie Ward. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Brothers. Yes. Dr. Johnson. Approved. Thank you. Matt Jorgensen. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Ruffin. Yes. Thanks. Uh, and Mr. Patch. Yes. Uh, I think that's all of us. Thank you. Okay. And then we will now consider um, Beth's second presentation for the, um, was it the Albemarle Historic District boundary increase? That's correct. So I hope you are seeing my screen again. And this time I apologize, I didn't go into slideshow mode last time, but. Um, now we're seeing your notes though. Great, okay. Um, how's that? Yep. Okay, Thanks. very good. Um, this is a, this is a, um, a big map to look at a lot of details. So I wanna make sure you have the best view of it. 
Okay, so the downtown Albemarle Historic District boundary increase proposes to expand the listed downtown Albemarle Historic District from five acres to 76 acres. Mm. You can see the extent of the proposed increase area shaded in purple on this map. And um, I have circled the existing downtown Albemarle Historic District, which was listed in the National Register in 2002, and it is outlined in blue. The proposed increase area also includes the 2005 National Register listed Second Street Historic District, where I've placed that red star, as well as the individually listed Snugs House here and the individually listed Albemarle Graded School. On the opposite side of the proposed increase area is the Albemarle Railroad and Industrial District. Um, and this is outlined here in green. It was study listed in 1990. As part of the Section 106 review process, this study list district was determined not eligible for listing in the National Register in 2018. Mm. The proposed boundary has been drawn to include several important buildings in Albemarle. Uh, among them are the 1972 Home Savings and Loan Association building, the uh, 1892 Morrow Brothers and Heath Company store, the 1972 Sandley County Courthouse, the 1972 Sandley County Public Library, the 1852-1880 Snugs House, the 1921-1952-1965 Albemarle Graded School, and the 1925 Albemarle High School. And our anchor points on the east side, or yes, on the, uh, on the west side of the proposed increase area are not as clear. Um, staff has several concerns about the boundary increase area as shown. First of all, the Albemarle Railroad and Industrial District, which was study listed in 1990, has lost some significant buildings over the past 32 years, leading to a determination in 2018 that it does not possess the qualities necessary for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Uh, second, the proposed boundary does not include the Wiscasset Hosiery Mill. My red star has moved up to the very top right corner of the screen now, which was individually study listed in 2016. So we'd like to know more about why the boundary uh, was drawn to end at the high school rather than include that study listed mill. And third, there are several pockets. I'm gonna show you two of them. There are several pockets within the boundaries as drawn that have sustained demolitions in relatively recent years, mm. and they should be considered carefully to determine the extent of loss. So my... Oh, Did Beth freeze for everyone? You know, these kind of resources. Yep. Beth, you, you froze for a sec there. So are you still there? Looks like she refroze again to me. I know. Yes. Okay. Sometimes I can't tell if it's on my end or on the other. Okay, hey, Matt. Am Beth, are you back? Yeah. Okay. Good. My internet sorry, dropped sure out for a minute too. I'm sorry. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, am I still sharing my screen? No. no. Okay. Let me reshare. I do apologize. I think mine dropped out too. I wonder if it was something with our VPN. Oh, I don't possibly. know. Um, Sarah, Mark. can you tell me how far I need to back up? You. The last thing I heard you talk about was the um, demolitions in the middle. Okay. You, okay. You need to swap your screen. You're sharing the notes version. Okay. Oh, I see what's happened. Um, so when I came back online on my VPN, it moved me. Um, I also have two screens that I work off of, and it's the computer decided to 
put me on the other screen. So let me, um, let me see here. Let me, I've got to get out of sharing mode in order to switch the screen that's doing the projecting. Okay, I apologize. All right, now we're down to one screen again. Okay, and let me get into presentation mode. And display. Okay. And is that better, Sarah? Thank okay. you. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay, great. All right. So um, we talked about how the hosiery mill's not been drawn in, and, and we just want to know more about that. Um, and then the third thing is that there are some pockets of demolition in the within the shaded purple area. One of them is here at North and First Street, um, where according to the, um, the dates given in the county property cards, um, there was quite a, there were a few buildings constructed in, in the mid 1990s. So we've lost some historic fabric here, creating what we, you know, we sometimes call a donut hole um, in, in our lingo here at, at this point in this proposed increase area. Then the second place where we, where we see a problem um, is down here just south of where the existing boundary ends, but before we get to that 1972 home savings and loan building. So um, we've got parking lots and then where this, you can see the edge of this grassy strip, there was a study listed house, individually study listed house on this corner, which is now gone. So we've lost some material there. Um, and then lastly, <clears throat> Staff has not had an opportunity to examine the proposed increase area in person in Albemarle. And this is not a requirement for a study listing, but it is a common practice that we follow, particularly when a proposed increase area is as extensive as this one is. Um, two weeks prior, now this is just to give you a little insight into our, our process. Two weeks prior to each National Register Advisory Committee meeting, um, the Survey and National Register branch meets to discuss the applications that we've received and to finalize the agenda for the upcoming meeting. And in most cases, staff communicates with the study list applicants either that Friday or the following Monday uh, with to report on our consensus as a staff to clarify any questions that need to be answered and sometimes we do it to ask if the applicant wants to stay on the next agenda. Um, so our staff consensus when we met this time for this downtown Albemarle historic district boundary increase is that we wanted to ask the applicant to wait until the June meeting so that the staff could assess this proposed increase area in person and advise to the likelihood um, of this particular boundary meeting the criteria for listing a district in the National Register. So um, Sarah had a phone conversation with the applicant, Preservation North Carolina, who did not want to wait for the June meeting mm -hmm. and asked to remain on the February agenda. So again, um, the staff consensus was, we'd like to take more time to determine a boundary that has a reasonable chance of being listed in the National Register but Sarah asked for me in this presentation to provide you all with a path to approve the proposed increase area as it is by asking you to include with any approval very clear language acknowledging the boundary as proposed will change before uh, a future National Register nomination is complete. And we may be looking at very extensive changes in this case. Um, in short, as the staff, we believe a significant amount of work remains to be done before this proposed increase area boundary is ready for the National Register. And whether you decide to defer this or to approve it today, um, we're asking you to acknowledge that, that this is a long way from a final National Register boundary when you make your, your mm -hmm. motions. And then just a little housekeeping. The current downtown Albemarle National Register Historic District 
is listed under criterion C and criterion A for commerce. Um, the current period of significance is 1898 to 1950. So we do, um, we do assume that when a boundary increase is, is prepared that additional documentation will likely also increase the period of significance later than 1950. Um, but until the boundary is better defined, it's not clear to us whether additional areas of significance would be warranted for a boundary increase. And that's all I have. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Beth. Um, you can go ahead and close the presentation. Well, un unless Please. there may be specific Actually, comments about the map okay. itself, so. I was gonna ask about the map, but it's probably, um, there was a part down kind of in the Southwest corner that looked almost like it was an open park or something, but it certainly looked like if the determined not eligible green area would cut that off. So would that be another part that kind of like the orange areas you were showing would be? Um, I'm sorry, I've, I've moved too quickly to stop sharing. Am I sharing again? Yes. Yes, you are. Okay, so are, were you referring to this right here? Uh, actually the pink part to the west of it that's not in oh. the green. So, so this is a, um, there's a house right here where my mouse is, and then there's a very large lot that goes with this house. Um, so if, if we couldn't get past this study listed area, I don't think we would get here. Mm -hmm. This is a, this is now, um, I believe city owned, I believe city owned green space. Um, and it has been improved and added to, you know, in the last 10 to 20 years um, with, with different, you know, features as a city owned property. Um, this might, this area right here might be my biggest concern with being able to get even to this study listed area. Um, but I do want to emphasize mm -hmm. that um, we've been working with uh, a, a very good application, um, also with Google Street View and aerial maps like you're seeing here. So when I'm showing you areas of concern, that's what, that's what we can get using Google Street View, using aerial maps. There could be other areas of concern that we'd prefer to look at in person and really assess closely on the ground. I have a procedural question. Um, so I kind of see a couple paths for us. We could um, recommend study listing with the understanding that the boundaries would change significantly, the boundary increase boundaries would change significantly. We could deny study listing or we could vote to defer consideration until the June meeting. And what does that mean for the processes that the applicant would go through in terms of the difference between, um, like if we deferred or if we said, yes, study list, but we recognize significant changes. Sarah, do you wanna try, try that one first and then I can follow up? Sure, um, it, doesn't, it, it, it doesn't make a huge difference. It's just, um, you know, it's just the timing. Um, generally we we don't um, encourage anyone to write a nomination or start a nomination before something is study listed right. um, so it's just a it's a delay of a few months um, in getting started with a nomination right um, and, so. and if we voted no would they be able to come back with the proposal for the study list at a, a later they well yeah they could they could come back with another study list application I, I i don't know i think that um if you're inclined to not be in favor of it today i would probably go with a deferral because it is a right, good right. application it just needs we just <laughs> wanted to check on it and and you know yeah. inherently the study list boundaries almost always change right. from, um, you know, 
in the process of listing, they get refined and, you know, just they get changed sometimes really substantially. Mm-hmm. So that's, that is understood, but then also sometimes it's not understood. And this one, because we don't have a lot of confidence in the boundary as proposed, um, we didn't feel like we could full, you know, wholeheartedly recommend it be approved, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, but the sponsor did want it to move forward. And so there is, there is an, a way to do that if, um, you know, if you guys are really specific about okay. knowing that it's going to change. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure we understand sort of what yeah. our options are and then the implications. Yeah. And, and, and if I can also, if I could also offer, we, we've come Many of you have been on here now for several terms, and some of you might have remembered, I want to say it was Kinston, Sarah, where we had a boundary expansion, and it was sort of bumping it out in various, you know, if you have this this original boundary, we're bumping out in this direction, that direction. It wasn't terribly dissimilar from this. I mean, we could go back and look at um, the language we use, because I think we did study list it, I believe, um, it's it's moved on to, to mm-hmm. nomination preparation and so forth. So. I just want to say as a cautionary matter, we've had a lot of discussion about sort of people's expectations at this stage mm-hmm. versus what moves forward towards a nomination. We we've, we've visited that topic um, today and have in the past as well. So um, I would just I would just encourage you, whatever decision you make is to give us feedback because those go into the study list letters that then govern frankly, people's expectations or help, help manage those. So Sarah, is that, am I stating it that correctly? Yes. Just if you, if you, if you guys were to approve, just uh, we need some language to manage expectations. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have another question. So I I know that they are um, anxious to have it on this agenda and they don't want to wait. Have they expressed, has the applicant expressed any willingness to change the boundary as it moves forward, or do they also seem pretty set on this? Um, Beth, I don't know if you have any insight. I I don't think in the conversation I have with the sponsor, I don't know that they were super set on the, on the boundary and, and the sponsor understands that, that if you were to approve it, it would be with, um, with the instruction that, changes are inevitable. Mm-hmm. Sure. I have to ask a question about the study list process in and of itself, and it relates to this property, but with that railroad property, if that's been determined not eligible, why is it still on the study list? We don't, we don't have a mechanism for removing things from the study list. The study list is non-binding. And doesn't it, it doesn't do anything? It's a weeding process for you all and for us to look at what we think would be a good candidate. And if the status of that changes, um, it, it just does. But we don't have a way to um, remove it. <laughs> I wish we did. It could eliminate some confusion. I, I've heard that, which is why I wanted to ask the question today. So what you're saying, though, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the boundaries can change for a study list property. But it can't come off the pro- can't come off the list. That's correct. Yeah, and so it's not really of- so much that the boundary of the study list changes; it's that the the boundary for the nomination might be different than the study list. And, okay, and so I'll ask one more one more follow up. Just I know this is slightly off topic, but I'm going to ask now because this seems like the appropriate time. In terms of Section 106 review, then for a property that is study listed for someone who's looking at those properties, if it's previously determined not eligible, it then gets reviewed again though for another under, for another undertaking. It's still on the list, so it still turns up in background research. Yes, uh, the, but the 106 process is, is, compl- is, se- is separate from, it, he, from this. Yeah, it is separate, but I, I hear what Mr. Patch is saying. It they they are considered, I think, by a lot of cultural resource professionals uh, in 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 this realm to be sort of flags, like, oh, you might need to look at this and figure out what this is. Um, and if you go and you explore HPO web, you'll see we've made notations about things over time. Um, but as Sarah points out, there is no mechanism under our state administrative code to remove things from from hmm. that because it's 
it's just not in there at this point. Um, but remember, this is a vetting step. This is this is helping give sort of a please proceed with further further study, further exploration. We think that you have something here. But I think we I look to Beth and Sarah. We we have run into this with some of the districts that we heard this morning as nominations too, where there's a refinement process. The, the question is, is how much refinement do we need to do between study list and nomination? And I think, I think we had some concerns about there was a little bit more than average here. If I'm, if I, if I have understood all the conversation and what we discussed in staff review a couple weeks ago. There's a lot of, there's a lot of potential excuse me, I'm, I'm beg your pardon. There's a lot of potential here for potential, as I said earlier, donut holes. And I think that was one thing that concerned staff more than, than normal. Cause we, Berman is absolutely right. We, we always refine study list boundaries for district or almost always refine them. Um, but when you're, when you're looking at edges and making refinements to edges, it's, um, it's a much different thing than potentially having to to cut out several blocks to avoid a donut hole. And that's where we just feel that we're under prepared um, to, um, to endorse this boundary without doing some closer study of the things that are well inside of it. I have a, a question for, uh, you know, general purposes for information and since I haven't been on the committee a long time. Uh, but the question is how often do uh, a request for boundary increases come before our committee? I think we get one at least every meeting, Dr. Denard, I, I would say. I mean, we had Dallas today was a boundary expansion mm -hmm. amendment process. Mm -hmm. um, it's rare that we don't, I, I'm just, thinking off the top of my head. It happens. Oh. And Albemarle, if it's, if it's 1950, I think it was listed, the existing district was listed sometime around 2000. Am I right about that? The um, the downtown Albemarle district, the smaller of the two was listed in 2002. Mm -hmm. And then the one that's just to the north of it um, was completed in 2005. Right. So things are aging in. Mm -hmm. To answer your question, Dr. Nard, I think that's when we come back and see what else is there to see more recent history that's quote aged in. So uh, can we, uh, can we uh, uh, prod that process or uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, initiate something if we see uh, the possibility that their properties maybe need to be included that were not included in all of that? Could we kind of uh, prod applicants to uh, uh, submit to boundary increases? We don't it's generally get, you know, we're looking for bottom up applications versus top down. You know, we're not, we're not going to be the, the government who's coming to tell you what to do with your, with your property. Um, however, uh, when we when all of us are in the field looking at stuff or we're talking to um, constituents who might be planners for a town or politicians in their town or just interested citizens, um, mm -hmm. that does come up. Uh, for instance, had a conversation recently with, um, with a citizen in Salisbury um, about a building. It's already within the district, but uh, at the time the district was listed, it was too young to be considered contributing. And we have a lot of activity, a lot of preservation activity in Salisbury. And um, we encouraged him to, you know, to talk to his town planner about funding a, an update for their district. So that prodding happens, but not in a way where we're going to come in without having first had someone open the door for that conversation. Right. I, I was just thinking in line with what uh, 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 Dr. Johnson had said about, uh, uh, you know, these uh, properties up in uh, uh, Warrington, you know, a lot of times individuals are not uh, familiar with the process, you know, uh, and they need to be uh, made aware, you know, how 
you know, things have changed and, and something can be done. You know, it's, it's just like, you know, the computer now uh, has made the democratization of information, you know, I mean, has democratized information. So more folk have access to it than the few individuals at one point to have access to this information. So we're still, you know, trying to reach, you know, uh, these communities and these folk in the communities who still have not had the process of, mm -hmm. of, of town planning, city planning and community planning that some individuals have had for a period of time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep, I agree with that completely. And, and Dr. Denard, if I could add to, I think our, our state is in a good position compared to some of our, uh, not necessarily neighboring states, but throughout the country. We, we have a robust sized staff who can work at you know, a, a regional level with people versus other states that have one Sarah and one Beth, and that's all that they, that's, that's all they have yeah. to help people with the national register. So uh, Sarah is right. We're, we're very keen to make suggestions and, um, and plant seeds, if you will, that we hope we'll get some, some growth from, again, that, that grassroots kind of approach. But I think it's that partnership that you're, uh, I think you're, you're hinting at, more than hinting at is, is something we try to foster a good deal. And we'd be very glad yeah. to, we want to move this forward. We just want to get some feedback from all of you if, if you think this is a good good candidate, just so that everyone's understanding we, their, the refinement process might need to be uh, particularly uh, careful here because of what was presented. We're reacting to what was presented to us. We're all reacting to that. Um, I have my last so question, and that is um, having heard of several staff vacancies, if we were to defer this to the next meeting, would the SHPO be able to see it in the next four months? Yes, I think we'd be able to get, get down there and make a site visit. But thank you for thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Dr. Denard, did you have something else that? Uh, I, I, I thought, uh, uh, if we were going to make a, a motion on this, uh, uh, that motion would contain uh, uh, certain specifics as to what should be done uh, with the property. Is that is that clear for the most part, uh, 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 Beth? I, I think that the primary ask from staff is just an opportunity to see the extent of what's being proposed on the ground and the opportunity to have a conversation about potentially refining the boundary before, um, before we put something out to the public that may not reflect what we can actually provide as a service to, to constituents. Um, so I think what we are really primarily asking for is opportunity to do on-site consultation and to have a, a, a discussion that refines um, the information that we've been given so far so that we have a, we can give a more robust recommendation to you all about uh, what a boundary increase would look like in Albemarle. So it's um, like Madam Chair, I'm prepared to offer a motion, I, but I do wanna let the discussion continue. Yeah. Josie, you were gonna, I just said it sounds like deferring to June would be best to me. Is that Is the that, motion we're going to offer? Well, I, I mean, we, we want it, it's sort of open for uh, a motion. So I, I can't, I can, mo I can move, but I can't be the sole person making that decision. So Josie, are you making a motion to defer? I would move to defer to June. Okay. Is I, there I a second? second? Okay. Matt Jorgensen second. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so we will move to 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 vote here. And um, just to like make this clear, um, the motion was to defer consideration until the June meeting. Um, and would staff also like us to tie in some further recommendation or anything like that, or we don't need to because we're deferring. So you don't need to because you're deferring. We'll yep. just communicate 
that to the sponsors who are probably, I mean, they're, and I'll say they're probably watching. Um, but we'll let them know how the discussion went and we will make sure we get down there before the June meeting. Great. Thank you. Okay, we'll move into our vote then. Do Dr. Bryan. I'm, I agree to move to defer. Thank you. Uh, Alicia McGill, I, I too uh, agree to defer. Uh, Mr. Belladin. I'm going to abstain because I don't feel like we have enough information to understand why it's been requested to move ahead. Okay. Thanks. Um, thank you. That's an abstention. Um, Mr. Bergstone. No. You vote no, no against the, the deferral. deferral. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Denard. I'll vote yes to defer. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Brothers. Yes to defer. Okay, Dr. Johnson. Yes, to defer. Okay, and uh, Mr. Patch. Yes, to defer. Okay, so there's um, one uh, of yes. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, yes to defer. Yes. Thank you. All right, I'm looking at my screen, and I think I have everybody else. Okay, so we have one abstention and one no to the deferral vote and the rest are, are yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have three more presentations this afternoon and I, I think um, I'm gonna make an executive decision to take a, a short break because I did promise everyone a break in the morning and in the afternoon. Um, and let's make this uh, a five minute break. Um, so that we can move quickly, um, which does have us returning at an awkward time, but we're gonna come back at 327. And please stay in the meeting if you can. Thank you.
Alicia. Yes. This is David Ruffin. Unfortunately, I've got a four o'clock call also that I need to be on. So, unfortunately, if you need me for voting after about three fifty-five, I may have. I will have peeled away. Okay. Sorry uh, about that. No, no, that's okay. Thank you for letting me know. Um, we have three presentations, but they're from three different people, and so it, as as we've gone in the past, we usually vote after each of those. Um, but we also do have. Uh, quorum so um it's kind of up to you when you think is um an appropriate time for you to step out you could step out you could leave us now or you could stay on for the next probably two presentations i'm not yeah sure i'll how try to stay i'll try to be here for as many presentations but if it's obvious that i wouldn't be able to vote i'll give away okay thank you thanks thanks for your understanding yeah i, I appreciate you a lot a lot going on and, and Again, tribute to staff for all yeah. the incredible work. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Alicia, similarly, I've got a 4 p.m. regulatory call, so I'll stay on and vote for everything. Okay. Then. Okay. I think even if we lose both of you, we should still be fine. So, um, yeah, there's currently 11 of us. So, yep. Two down, it's a yep. Thing. Yep. We're fine. We're good. As everybody signs back on, um, please turn your cameras on for our committee members so that I know that you're back with us. And Julie, you'll be our first presentation, right? The Yadkin Hospital. Yeah, just let me know when you want me to share. Yeah, um, we, we are all here. Okay. So um, if you could please share and um, for our committee members, we will consider each of these um, presentations separately and just vote on each of them to follow um, precedent. All right, um, can everybody hear me and see that? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, today I'll be presenting the study list application for the former Yadkin Hospital located in Albemarle, Stanley County. Uh, Stanley County is located here in red, and um, as we were just looking at, this is Albemarle, um, downtown Albemarle is just east of US 52, and the um, hospital is west of the US 52 corridor. This is an aerial view showing the proposed study list boundary. It includes the 1926 hospital, the adjacent 1938 nurses home, and a storage shed. These historic photographs showcase the signature Y shape and its commanding appearance, which is currently hard to discern due to the mature trees. 11 Stanley County physicians purchased property and erected the Yadkin Hospital that opened in August, 1926. In 1929, Yadkin Hospital's Board of Trustees conveyed its property to Stanley County in order to obtain a nonprofit designated designation necessary to receive funding from the Duke Endowment. The facility then became the county's first publicly owned hospital. In 1950, it merged with the Stanley General, becoming the Stanley County Hospital and ceasing operation. In 1953, the hospital became the Baptist home for the age, aging assisted living facility, which is still in use today. So from 1953 onward, some changes took place. Notably, the original multi-pane casement windows on the second floor sun porch were replaced. So here are the original, and this is what it looks like. Now, um, the front entry steps, walkway, front door, terracotta tile, light fixtures have all replaced original features. Moving around to the west elevation and south wing, you can see that little has changed in this view. Continuing around to the south end, there's a sunroom on the top floor, which is the second of the two original. And here you can see the north and south wing extensions from the rear of the building. This is the north wing and east elevation. So just keep, we're just moving around the sides. This is the north wing north elevation um, with a covered walkway that connects to the nurse's home. And this is the last of the exterior photos of the grounds. Um, it's the storage shed uh, behind the, the hospital. 
Uh, these are current floor plans made by the site administrator. Although the hospital's interior was adapted for use as elderly housing in 1953, the original corridor floor plan is substantially intact. The entrance corridor empties into a central stair hall extending to each wing. The stair features original unpainted paneled square nules, molded handrails, and square balusters. This is the parlor off the front foyer and a residence room with original hardwood floors, panel doors, and 12 over one window. The landing um, on the second floor and looking down the south corridor. This is the second floor sunroom, um, which is over the, the main northwest entrance. Moving to the basement, there is a chapel or meeting room in the southwest corner, which historically served as the ward for African American patients. African American and white patients received care in segregated wards. This was typical in rural areas to have whites and blacks share hospitals in different wards due to lack of funding in se for separate hospitals. And here's the kitchen and dining room, also in the basement with vinyl tile that emulates wood in the dining room and adjacent corridor. Now we're moving on to the colonial revival style nurses home that was constructed in 1938. Although the footprint and main exterior features of the home remain, the most problematic aspect is the full width entrance terrace, which was enlarged to improve accessibility. Here are the south and west elevations of the nurses' home. So just moving around the back and to the other side. This is the foyer looking east into the parlor and sunroom. Although the building's interior was remodeled in 2007, the application states the original floor plan remains mostly intact. The most prob problematic feature on the interior is the wall between the kitchen and the living room that was removed creating a single open room. The east wall was veneered with variegated stone around a large fireplace and classical mantles in both the living room and sun porch. Full height openings into the sunroom were also created. In the sunroom, you can see the altered openings as well as the fireplace around. And this is an example of a typical room on the second floor. Um, vinyl tile with new vanities and fixtures were installed in the restrooms, um, but it retains original hardwood floors, paneled doors, and, and windows. Although there were two earlier hospitals in Stanley County and several in surrounding counties around the same time, some ceased operation early, were not a public hospital, or no longer standing, or not as austere as the Yadkin Hospital. And here are some similar examples that have been listed on the National Register, um, including City Hospital that was built in 1926 as part of Gaston Memorial Hospital, which was nominated, um, including the nurse's home or nurse's school and dormitory. The 1927 Richardson Memorial Hospital in Greensboro, the Chatham Memorial in Surrey County, which also has a nurse's home and from a Duke Endowment Fund, and the Mariah Parham Hospital in Henderson. So in conclusion, staff recommends the Yadkin Hospital be placed on the state study list for its local significance under criterion A in the area of health and medicine. Although there are some changes and interior updates, staff believes it retains enough historical integrity to convey its significance as an important local medical facility. The property's period of significance likely begins with the hospital's 1926 completion and continues through its 1950s closure. So that completes my presentation. Thank you, Julie. <clears throat> Questions, comments, or uh, motion? I'll move approval. All right, is there a second? I'll second. Okay, thank you. So the motion to approve was Dr. Denard and um, the second was from um, Ms. Ward. All right, we will move into our vote. Dr. Bryan. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you. Uh, Alicia McGill, yes. Matt Jorgensen. Yes. 
Thank you. David Ruffin. Yes. Thank you. Fred Belladin. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Brothers. Yes. David Bergstone. Yes. Sean Patch. Yes. Thank you. And Dr. Johnson. Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, so we will move on to the next presentation from um, Jeff Smith. Let's see if I can get this right this time. All right, small victory. Um, I'm presenting the Jesse and Mary Knox Washam Farm. Uh, it's located on uh, Davidson Concord Road uh, near Davidson in the upper northeast corner of Mecklenburg County. Um, this just kind of gives you an idea. This was the, um, I'm just going to leave it here for a while. I'm going to read my script and then we'll kind of go to the pictures. It's going to show you how the, the proposed boundary has evolved from this larger piece. Uh, the Washington Farm sits south of uh, North Carolina 73, uh, approximately four tenths of a mile west of the Mecklenburg Cabarrus County line. The farmhouse, situated on a 6.47 acre parcel, is a one and a half story side gable craftsman, craftsman bungalow, which is fronted by a large front lawn shaded by mature oak trees and surrounded by three sides, on three sides, by the farm's outbuildings. Jesse Washam's father, Henry, built the original section of the house in 1900 when he owned and farmed this land. This original section, which has now been relegated to form a large rear wing with an enclosed side porch, runs along the eastern elevation. The porch terminates at the 1922 addition that Jesse Washam constructed. The front addition, three bays wide and two bays deep, and sheathed with white painted weatherboard siding, features two over two wood, wood sash windows, two side chimneys with corbel caps, one of which uh, the east chimney was destroyed and rebuilt um, at following Hurricane Hugo in 1989. Uh, low overhanging eaves with exposed rafter tails, exposed trusses, and a centrally located front gable corner with paired windows. Uh, in addition, the Washam Farm complex includes six outbuildings most of which date from the 1920s and early 30s. The frame barn, the oldest and largest of these outbuildings, is sited south of the house. A large frame, tool, and equipment shed with a lean-to side addition was used to have for the Washam's tractor, and a combination corn crib and tool shed, also a frame structure, stand between the main house and the barn. A small frame structure east of the house was originally used as a brooder house, which is a chicken house used for small chickens, uh, and it included a small furnace to keep them warm as they grew. To the west of the house is a small frame garage with a lean-to addition. Immediately adjacent to the farmhouse is a 1935 well house. This collection of intact domestic and agricultural outbuildings adds to the significance of the Washington farm. Uh, Jesse Washam inherited property following his father's death. Uh, he eventually married Mary Knox, and they began amassing additional plots of his father's former lands. Uh, he farmed land, planting corn, grain, and cotton, which became his major cash crop. However, the Great Depression resulted in declining cotton prices, and Jesse's farming operations were never, never as profitable as they once were. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go through the pictures. So there's an aerial view um, that shows the Washam farm. And here's a close up of the built resources, which you can kind of see in the pink square towards the top near NC 73. So that's the proposed boundary. Again, it's, you know, that's what's being proposed, but who knows? Uh, this is a site plan uh, that was prepared by the consultant uh, who was hired by the owners. So again, just to, here's a listing of the uh, outbuildings, um, the, a cotton shed is no longer extant. Here's a close-up shot of the tenant house, Northwest Elevation. 
kind of see it set back from the from the road not quite a bit, not that deep, but anyway, it's not right on the road either. There's a couple of views showing the, um, the proximity of the outbuildings to the house. Here's some additional elevation shots of the bungalow. And you can see in the picture on the right, you can see a portion of that main uh, 1900 block. And again, the arrows point to that 1900 section of the house. There's some interior floor plans, kind of shows the flow of rooms in the house, the half story, of course, on the, on the right. Here's some interior shots from the first floor. And then from the second floor, but the staircase, uh, obviously on, on the far left, there's a lot more, um, I guess a higher degree of integrity so far as the interior finishes on the, the half story, at least from what I can see from the pictures. And here are some of the outbuildings. Here's the very uh, sizable barn on the left. Here's the well house on the left, and there's the brooder house. I, I did a, a comp um, just kind of looking at other prop, other farms in the in our database. Um, came up with about 30 in Mecklenburg County. Approximately 12 of those farms are no longer extant. Um, of the remaining farms, most were anchored by a two-story frame house as opposed to a one and a half story bungalow. Mm -hmm. Um, the frame house being much more common. The earliest of those houses date to 1853, while most were dated to the turn of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Many properties that date to 1900 lacked integrity, had lost their outbuildings, or had been encroached upon by dense suburban development. Uh, the most similar comp comparable property is the Presley Farmhouse, which is located in Charlotte. Uh, while it exhibits the craftsman architectural style, it possesses low integrity. Another similar comp is another Craftsman farmhouse also in Charlotte, uh, has good integrity, but only two outbuildings remain. And again, dense suburban development is adjacent on both sides of the parcel. Um, the Charlotte Mecklenburg Historic Landmark Commission designated the Washington Farm a Mecklenburg County landmark in 2003. Uh, in 2011, uh, this property was part of, uh, was reviewed by our office as part of a section 106 consultation. Uh, it was recommended eligible for the National Register under Criterion C, um, and our office concurred with that. Uh, so in conclusion, staff recommends placement of the Jesse and Mary Knox Washam Farm on the state study list. Further, staff recommends the Washam Farm. Washam Farm is potentially eligible for the National Register at the local level of significance under Criterion C as an intact representative of a, a rural North Carolina farmstead, a rapidly diminishing resource on North Carolina's landscape. In addition, the Washington Tenant House itself is a rare surviving example of a bungalow farmhouse in Mecklenburg County. Although bungalows are popular throughout the county's numerous small towns and in Charlotte, the Washington Tenant House represents a break from the area's typical farmhouse, which again is the simple two-story frame uh, house. So. I will stop sharing. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> Are there any comments, questions, or a motion? And just to remind everybody, we're um, considering staff recommendation to study list, and that's what we'll be would be voting on. I know a couple people right. unmuted themselves. I, I move the uh, study list. Recommendation. Approval. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Or, okay. Thank you. So Dr. Bryan moved um, to approve, approve staff recommendations and um, Fred Belladin uh, seconded. Uh, we'll jump into our vote. Alicia McGill. Uh, yes. Dr. Denard. Yes. Thank you. Matt Jorgensen. Yes. Thank you. David Ruffin. Okay, thank you. Uh, it was yes. a yes, so thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, Josie Ward. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Brothers. Yes. 
Thank you. David Bergstone. Yes. Dr. Johnson. Yes. Thanks. And Sean Patch. Yes. Thank you. All right. We have one more presentation from the Eastern region from John Wood. All right, we'll close out the day. Mm. You all see that uh, PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. So uh, our only study list from the East is the Elms, and this is an owner submitted application. And the Elms is located in rural central Edgecombe County, east of the town of Whitaker, and the property abuts the Edgecombe Halifax County line, which is the green county line as is, is um, shown there just behind the arrow. So this image with the house site marked by the red arrow is just to show you how rural the area is. Essentially, it's a flat landscape that consists primarily of farm fields and timber tracks that are dotted with occasional house or farm complexes. So very rural, very bucolic agricultural setting. The property consists of 480 acres of what's 250 is in farmland and the remainder of the property is in timber. The house and the complex of outbuildings sit one mile off the road, which is the east-west running gray line towards the bottom of the screen. And to enter the property, you proceed northward up a three-quarter mile long dirt lane that runs along the western edge of the property. And there you come to a tenant house and a gin house, which is shown at the bottom of the screen here. And from there, you continue northward through a quarter mile long alley of trees, at which point the driveway turns to the northeast leading to the house and the farm complex, which is located at the top of the screen. The uh, agricultural and domestic outbuildings are arranged in a rough arc to the north and east of the house. And as I mentioned, uh, the driveway curves and leads to the main house. So the bottom image you see here is, is what you see as you approach the house. The house itself was constructed in the mid 1820s by a gentleman named Mel Drawn. And this was the center of a large farm property, like I mentioned. And this property has actually been in continual family ownership since the 1820s with the current owner, I believe, actually being the eighth generation owner of this property. Now, the main house consists of a two-story, three-day, single-pile hall, parlor plan, frame dwelling, and timber, heavy timber frame construction. And sometime around 1900 to 1915, the house was greatly enlarged with an expansive one-story addition mm -hmm. to the rear that added multiple rooms. So what you're seeing on the floor plan, if you look to the, the left of the image, the two rooms, to the left with the chimneys, that's the 1820s portion of the house and everything to the right of that is that Victorian addition to the house. Uh, changes to the original house undertaken at the same time as that large Victorian addition include the addition of the one-story wrap around with the Korean detailing that you see there and the replacement of, of the wood sash windows with one over one sash windows. So I'll walk you around the building. This is going towards the, the rear facing towards the front of the house. This is the very back of the house. Coming around the side, you see to the left of the screen, that uh, was originally an open porch that had been enclosed mm -hmm. at some point with a bank window. And then can continue around the other side. This is the west elevation of the house and then back to the farm. Um, so really, the um, other than minor changes to accommodate bathrooms and an enlarged kitchen, the floor plan remains unchanged since the Victorian addition. And, and as you see here, those two rooms, like I said, to the left of the 1820s and everything um, to the right is the Victorian addition, which included bedrooms, um, a kitchen and pantry, and uh, the, the room marked as a den probably the original kitchen and you had a, a short hallway and some closet space. On the second floor of the 1820s part, it was just a two rooms with a, a, where the stair came up. The western, or I guess the eastern room has been subdivided to, to create a bathroom space. So the house was recently rehabilitated um, and it 
took some significant work. Uh, the work included the repair of structural damage, the removal of all the plaster, refinishing of all woodwork. Um, there was some replacement of some insect damage flooring, sanding and refinishing of remaining historic floors, the installation of spray foam and fiberglass fat insulation in the wall cavities, um, installation of gypsum board walls and little plaster. And as part of the project, the one over one Victorian wood sash windows were restored. So those one over one windows you saw are actually the, the 1900, 1915 windows that were put in. And then they also upgraded mechanical and HVAC and electrical system. So to take you inside, uh, this is the two first floor rooms in the 1820s parts. You see some really spectacular uh, three part federal mantles. Uh, flat panel wainscot, and again, the walls are, are gypsum board. Uh, this is an image, the top image is from that Victorian addition looking towards the front door of the house, and then the bottom is facing the other direction towards that back hall, which that goes through that door leads to the enclosed uh, porch, and to the right is one of the bedrooms and dining rooms. So this is um, some images of what would be the western bedroom and the bathroom that was created. Uh, this is the easternmost bedroom in that Victorian portion, and the bottom is what probably was a kitchen. They use it as kind of dining room space now. Um, this is the current kitchen that included a pantry space, and the wall between the kitchen and pantry was removed to enlarge that kitchen. Uh, this is the second floor of the 1820s portion of the house and on the bottom image you can see they stood up a half wall so behind that wall is the the entrance door into that room so that's now a uh, bathroom space but also has those three part federal mantles on the upper floor so moving through the complex there's a, a series of outbuildings um, mostly agricultural outbuildings and the majority of those buildings date to 1900 to 1940. Um, immediately out the back, there's the blacksmith shop or farm shop, which has a neat little forge and anvil in it. So this is probably where a lot of the farm repairs were done. I actually have a nice 1940s farm all tractor to go with it. Um, the only remaining domestic outbuilding is this smokehouse, which probably dates to the 1850s, 60s. And then there's a later um, little lean-to or shed roof addition off to one side. 1938 chicken coop, a pack house that has a grating um, building and maybe a border pit down in that uh, portion of the building. That's the 1900 building. A fairly large sheep barn that has um, equipment sheds that are pull, of pole construction um, that dates to the 1930s. That's a, a pretty sizable uh, barn on the property. That's the back side of it. Um, some other buildings that they did not provide photographs of include a barn, a 1913 one car garage, some modern metal grain bins, a bulk barn, and there's a family cemetery. And then south of that alley trees, I mentioned the, the gin house, which still has uh, ginning equipment in it. And then a tenant house, which has an 1820s portion, a 1918 edition, and then a 1950s edition. To that and again, they're not pictures of either of those buildings. So the property is potentially eligible under criterion A in the area of agriculture, and the continual occupation of the property by the same family may show how the, the drawn family lived and used the house and managed and operated their farming operation through changing agricultural and social trends from the mid 1820s through the 1940s. Now, Edgecombe County was a prime cotton producing county and by 1860 was producing more cotton than any other county in the state. And the drawn plantation was likely a significant cotton producer, as is evidenced by well drawn large slave holdings, which in 1850 was uh, 46 slaves. So there was a, a quite a significant enslaved population that occupied the farm. Tenant houses on and near the farm show the transition from enslaved labor to um, tenant farming after the Civil War. And then between 1880 and 1900, the production of tobacco in Edgecombe County rose dramatically. And during that period, Edgecombe County moved from 80th to 11th in the state as far as tobacco output. And while the extant outbuildings on the farm indicate 
uh, that a diverse farm economy that included cotton, tobacco, and livestock existed on the farm, a more in-depth analysis of, of the sort of field patterns and field layout would be needed if this proper, property were to be listed under Criterion A. Um, unfortunately, the owner did not provide um, any information on the drawn family, so we can't assess their, the significance of the people who live there uh, associated with the property under Criterion B. Uh, the property is not a strong candidate for listing under Criterion C. Now, Edgecombe County has quite a few high style and very intact federal period houses, and the Elms represent a well-built but fairly modest federal period house. And the large Victorian addition and changes are also moderate, modest utilitarian modifications that represent the continued use and evolution of the property. And we see numerous farmhouses that have been changed over time. And, and the staff thinks that the evolutionary changes that have been made to the Elms did not appear to rise to the level of significance necessary for a criteria to see argument. Um, and while the rehabilitation work is of high quality, the staff also has concerns that the level of that work has resulted in the loss of much of the patina that typically characterizes historic uh, houses. The outbuildings that are associated with the, the farm complex represent common building types and forms that primarily date to the period 1900 to 1940. And due to the deteriorated condition, many of these buildings have significant integrity issues. Uh, for Criterion D, the property is potentially eligible under the criterion D for a very high potential for containing intact archeological deposits and features. And the owner provided oral history information regarding the location of now gone buildings and farm features. And visually there appears to have been very little ground disturbance on the property. So archeological features that may retain, that may remain have the potential to provide important insights to the plantation, large enslaved population, um, earlier domestic activities and outbuildings associated with the main house, as well as the evolution of the farm complex and the agricultural landscape relating to changes in farm labor, agricultural practices, and the types of crop grown. So staff is recommending placement on the study list on the local level with listing potential for criterion A and criterion B. Uh, any questions, if there are any? Questions, comments, or motion? I've left you all speechless. Move for approval to put on the study list. All right, great. That was David Burkstone. Uh, is there a second? Second. Dr. Bryan, thank you. All right, we'll move into our Wonder. final vote of the day, right? uh, uh, Alicia McGill, I vote yes to approve stack staff recommendations to put the Elms on the study list. Uh, Dr. Denard. I vote yes. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Jorgensen. Yes. Thank you. Ms. Ward. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Brothers. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Johnson. Yes. And Mr. Patch. Yes. All right. Uh, so that's our final property for consideration for uh, the day. Uh, is there a motion to, do we have to move to end the meeting? Motion to adjourn, Matt Jordan. Uh, all right. <laughs> you don't need a second. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, um, Thank, thank you, everyone, for um, a long but um, fascinating um, and engaging day. And thanks again to staff. Y'all are um, doing an incredible job, and we really appreciate it, and we really enjoy it. So, um, and, uh, yeah. And thank you. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I'm sorry that I uh, lose track sometimes. It's hard to no, keep No, you're going. doing great. Thank you. Thanks. Well, I enjoy it too. So, um, all right. Well, unless there are any final things, um, we will see you all in June. Take care and be Thank well. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye.